Okay, and uh, welcome to everybody in the room and to those watching from home. We are here uh, gathered as Committee of the Whole on Monday, November 16th. Uh, I just want to start by acknowledging that we're gathered here on the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish people, specifically the Lekwungen speaking people known today as the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations, and their connections to these lands continue to this day. I also just uh, point out that this meeting is being live streamed and will be archived for future viewing on the website. Um, as uh, those in the room know, but perhaps those at home might not, uh, when we sit as Committee of the Whole, this is a less formal gathering of council. Uh, we're not here to make decisions tonight. We are here to uh, to have a, a more informal discussion around uh, issues and make and make recommendations to council for more formal considerations. So it gives us a chance to to delve a bit deeper into some of the issues that face us. So. Uh, with that, we'll get jump right to the agenda. And uh, the first item on the agenda is a request for an additional driveway access at 1259 Oliver Street. And I'm not sure is... Uh, uh, we, we want to go so out the other way and come in that way, is that right? And I believe we have our, our manager of engineering here to speak to this item, is that correct? Welcome. Good evening, Your Worship. Good evening, Council. Sorry, it's always very awkward going through the wrong door. <laughs> I will keep this brief. There are two adjacent lots on Oliver Street, 1259 and 1249. 1259 has a home on it. 1249 is vacant. Both lots are owned by the same folks, and they are looking to develop 1249. In order to gain access to a home on 1249, they are seeking permission to put a second driveway across 1259 through an easement. This will allow them to construct a driveway access while having to remove fewer mature trees than they would if they were to bring in the driveway from Oliver Street. Um, because that would mean two driveway crossings on 1259, it does require council approval under the driveway access bylaw. So that is what I am presenting on, and that is what we are here to discuss. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Rennick. Uh, and uh, is the applicant uh, here available online as well? I believe they're out in the hall. Okay. I could bring them in. Nope, no, nope. stay where you are. <laughs> uh, what we'll do is we'll just go to, uh, to the members of the uh, committee and they'll take questions. If there's questions for the applicant, then we'll invite them in. Um, but go ahead, Councillor Ney. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, the logic of this sound makes a lot of sense, and uh, thank you really for thinking about that and the interest of the, the trees. I was just wondering, after the property one, uh, 1249 is developed, is it the intention to keep that as the uh, easement to that property? Mr. Rennick? Uh, through you, Mayor. Yes, the yeah. easement would remain on title. So, okay, and the easement would be the way that the property is accessed for the driveway. Okay, thank you. That is correct. And the district would also be registered as a third party to that easement just to ensure that the driveway can be maintained. Thank you, Mr. Rennick. Councillor Braithwaite and then Councillor Selka. Um, thank you. I'd reiterate what um, Councillor Ney said about um, uh, it seems like it's a reasonable... Uh, place to put that driveway and, and to save a lot of those trees. Um, I think it's a good um, it's a good uh, um, compromise. Um, I'm also um, happy to hear that um, the 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 municipality will be on that easement because that would have been my only concern. Would have been um, had the municipality not been on there, then would there have been a bit an ability to um, put hard surface there? without us really knowing or being an involved so so I'm uh, I'm happy to hear that so that that is the case that we would be notified okay thank you thank you councillor Braithwaite councillor Zelka then councillor Green unless more participants join uh, this conference will end in five minutes enter star one to cancel and continue the conference oh yes of course uh, councillor Appleton are you still online with us Uh, just checking again, Councillor Appleton. Councillor Appleton. Oh, you can't. You're. You can hear us, okay? 
I can hear you, but although I did hear the announcement about the imminent discontinuation. <laughs> I, think we, I think we fixed it, so we're good to go. Thank you. I just didn't want to lose you and make sure that you were still there, so thank you. Um, uh, sorry, Councillor Braithwaite, are you completed then? Uh, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, so a question through you to staff. Uh, the first driveway on 1259 Oliver, according to the drawing, uh, appears to have an oak tree in the middle of it. Is that true? Mr. Rennick? Uh, through you, Mayor, to Council, yes, it is true. There is an oak tree in the middle of the driveway. Is there plans to remove that oak tree or to make that driveway somehow usable? Uh, that is not being addressed at this time. Thank you. So effectively then, from a practical perspective, 1259 Oliver Street will have one functional driveway uh, once this has been built. I would say that that's an accurate assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Green. Thank you. And through you, thank you very much, Mr. Ranning, for the report. And I'm uh, <clears throat> really pleased about the efforts between staff and the owners to one, protect the, tr to protect the tree canopy, and two, to come up with a solution that is a good compromise and, and doesn't create hardship in any way. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Councillor Green. Um, are there any questions of the applicant that we should bring them in for? Yeah, so go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> to sit up here or something. Uh, just to follow up on Councillor Zelka's question, that large, there is a lo large oak tree, tree right in front of the garage at, and drive at 1259. So that would leave one property then without a driveway access or access to their garage. So I see that being very problematic in that we are, we're, we're making access for the as of yet undeveloped property at 1249. And leaving the problem then at at twelve fifty nine of really not having a garage or driveway to that lot. So, I, I you know I w there is nothing that would preclude the um, owner of the property at twelve fifty nine from coming to us in the future and asking to perhaps remove the oak tree that is blocking that garage and driveway and is that oak tree is that actually on that property is or is it on municipal property uh, mr rennick uh through you mayor per the drawing from zebra design that was attached it appears to be on the property uh maybe slightly overhangs the property line mm. Uh, the other question I have is, uh, if the property is developed at 1249, is there, um, there, w there was mention in there of, of rock outcrop. Would that lot require blasting? And if so, would the blasting at 1249 be intensive blasting that in fact could then impact the trees that this is before us? trying to save those trees that will be impacted by the blast. I'm not sure Mr. Rennick answered that question, but I'll, uh, I, I'll give it to him in any case. I don't have that information at this time, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, and just one last question about the easement. Um, the, the district will be a third party, as, as you said, but the driveway that is there, the right to remedy if hard surfacing was put in, um, the right for remedy would lie with the owner of the property at 1259 because it is on that property. Is that correct? Mr. Ramit? I, I believe that is correct, yes. Uh, Councilor Braithwaite? Um, yeah, um, I, through you um, to Mr. Rennick. Um, I, that driveway, though, on 1259 is being used right now, even though that oak tree is there, is it not? So the oak tree doesn't make a difference to that particular driveway. In so far as they are able to park on that driveway, but I believe it prevents them from having vehicular access to their garage. So I think they can parallel park with that tree there, but they couldn't get a car in or out of the garage. Thank you for that clarification. Um, is there any uh, desire to speak to the applicant on this to answer any of those questions on future use or anything? 
Uh, I'm happy to make the motion that it be recommended to council that the application for a second driveway at 1259 Oliver Street be approved. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Councillor Appleton, I just want to make sure I, no, it's fine. The motions are always in order. I just, uh, it's just, uh, we'll just, if there's any additional comments or questions, we'll take those. Uh, Councillor Appleton? Um, no, I don't have anything further on this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a motion uh, recommending approval to council. Uh, is there any further discussion? Councillor Zelka? Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, is this where we ask for input from the public on these sort of things, or, or is this uh, something that we don't ask, we don't go to the public on? We do. I'm just out of, out of practice here, so uh, we will go to the public and ask if there's any input. I should actually start off each one with a notice of the, of the phone number. Um, so if for anybody who wishes to call in, it's on the agenda package, but it's 250-598-3311. Uh, I'll make that call at the beginning of each session and going forward. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Uh, um, so if anybody wishes to call in at this point, this would be an appropriate uh, point in time to do so. Um, I believe uh, there is no public notification process attached to this. I believe this would go to Council for discussion and decision at the next Council meeting. Is that correct? Yes. Getting nods from staff, so that's a yes. Um, so I'm just going to reach out to staff. Is there anybody calling in on this item? Ms. Williams? Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other dis hands or discussion on this item. In that case, I will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Councillor uh, Appleton? In favor. And Councillor, oh, Councillor Patterson opposed? Okay, uh, Councillor Patterson opposed, thank you. And I will try in, in, in future to make sure I just call for all those in favor, including those remote, and then come back to those if anybody's opposed. So thank you. Um, item number two on the agenda is a development application of 000026. I believe, Mr. Rennick, you're leaving. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Have all a right. wonderful evening. You too. And I believe we have our uh, uh, director of or some member of the planning department. I'm not sure who's, uh, who's speaking to this item tonight. Ms. Williams, is there, do we? Uh, yes, Deborah Jensen will be speaking to this and she okay. is on Teams. Great, thank you very much. So we'll invite her in just a moment. I just want to, at the beginning of this, this is for discussion uh, of a development application for 1476 Beach Drive. That's 1476 Beach Drive. If anybody wishes to, call in and speak to council on this agenda item. You're more than welcome to do so. The phone number is 250-598-3311. That's 250-598-3311. I won't be sorry when this goes away. <laughs> we have to say the phone number every time. Uh, so with that, uh, Ms. Jensen is online. Um, Ms. Jensen, uh, would you like to do a brief introduction of this item? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So this is my first experience at virtually speaking to council, so I just want to check the volume. We are good to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so this application relates to the form and character of that existing multifamily building at 1476 Beach Drive. It is a 13-unit building that was constructed in 1960, and a few changes have been made to the building since that time. The existing wrought iron railings that run along the front of the building, so facing the waterfront, are now falling into disrepair. They've had significant weathering. There's significant rust that's now appearing on the railing. The proposal is to replace those railings with a new system that would consist of powder-coated aluminum and clear glass panels. This new design is in keeping with the original concept for the building, and they're proposing no other changes. The proposed design is in front of council tonight, which was reviewed by the advisory design panel at their November meeting. They were supportive of the application and noted that the design was simple and clean and in keeping with the original balcony design for the building. Staff have also reviewed the application with respect to the guidelines that are set out for the multi-unit residential development permit area. The new railing will contribute to the streetscape by maintaining a sense of openness while respecting the era of that 1960s building. All aspects of the proposal are compliant with both the zoning bylaw regulations and no variances are required. And staff are requesting council direction. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jensen. Is there, uh, is there an applicant here this evening as well or is it just a staff report in front of us today, Ms. Williams, do you know? Yep. 
Uh, it is just the staff report today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so are there questions of staff at this time? No Councillor Appleton, any questions? Is it the architect? Yeah. No questions, Your Worship. My apologies, Your Worship. The architect for the project is available should Council have any questions. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. I don't think we're going to have a lot of questions on this one, but uh, I'm not seeing many hands shooting up. Um, sorry, Councillor Patterson. I'm happy to move the recommendation if we're ready to do that. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Sorry. So we have a uh, sorry. We have a motion. I'll take the motion, but we'll still, uh, reach out to the public as well. Uh, so we have a mover and a seconder. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, happy to take any calls again from the public on this item two five zero five nine eight three three one one. Uh, we have no one in who's registered to speak to this item, but uh, as I said at the beginning of this session, you can welcome to call in. Is there, Ms. Williams, has anybody called in to speak to this item? Nobody has called in, Your Worship. Thank you, Ms. Williams. So back to this table. Um, any further discussion? Councillor Green? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And I was at the ADP meeting where, where this matter arose. Um, and it, is, it, it has been on the books for a while. And I know that uh, the applicants have been working with with building and planning for some time. So I'm very happy to see this coming to a conclusion and I'm sure the applicants are too and I appreciate uh, the work of staff as well working with this group. But um, I, the, the ADP was very supportive. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. I don't see a lot of other hands to speak to this. So I will be ready to call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Um, item number three on the agenda is 1538 Monterey Avenue zoning amendment. Uh, Ms. Jensen, I'm assuming you're here again to speak to this. Before I talk, let, invite you, I just want to remind anybody in, at home or uh, remotely watching who wishes to speak to us on this agenda item, you may call in to 250-598-3311. That's 250-598-3311, and I'll reach out uh, for public comment uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, Ms. Jensen, welcome. Thank you. Um, as Council knows, the district is the owner of two residential properties just off of Oak Bay Avenue. One of those is at 1531 Hampshire and another one at 1538 Monterey Avenue. For both of those properties, the district has entered into lease agreements with the Victoria Immigrant and Refugee Centre Society to use those two properties to house newly arrived refugees. The Hampshire property will house one family, but the society is proposing to use the Monterey home for a mix of refugees, which could include couples, individuals, and single parents for up to a maximum of eight people. In order to do that, a zoning amendment would be required that would allow for housing additional unrelated individuals and their related support systems. So, for example, the society is proposing to have an on-site caretaker as well as provide programs for the refugees to help them integrate into the community. For example, proposed workshops for language instruction, community orientation, and cooking and gardening lessons. The lease agreement itself allows for up to eight newly arrived refugees and accommodation for a caretaker so long as a zoning amendment to accommodate this is adopted. The district did commit to initiating the zoning amendment for the proposed use. Uh, should it not be successful, the society would be subject to the existing regulations for the RS5 zone for the one family residential use. The property itself is within the official community plan established neighborhoods designation. This provides for a variety of residential uses, including single family homes, duplexes and triplexes. The OCP also contains policy that would support more diverse housing options and particularly the need for increased congregate housing. The proposed zoning as laid out in the draft bylaw in front of council does not change the zoning of the property from the current RS5 for one family residential use. Rather, for this specific site, it introduces a site specific zoning amendment that on this property only, a congregate housing use would be permitted that would allow for up to a maximum of eight persons and two domestic staff. 
Amending the RS5 to include congregate housing on this site would provide for additional people beyond what is normally considered a family under the zoning bylaw and would address the need for domestic support. That would then allow Verks to accommodate up to eight people and the caretaker. So should council wish to move forward with this proposal, the bylaw would require three readings and a public hearing before consideration of adoption of the bylaw. Staff are recommending January 14th, 2021 as the preferred date for holding a public hearing. Uh, based on that information, we're now requesting council direction on the proposed amendment. Thank you very much, Ms. Jensen. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, yes, um, through you, Mayor, to um, Ms. Jensen. Um, Ms. Jensen, I noticed that in the staff report that it doesn't say anything about the two-year lease that I believe we had it discussions about. So I'm wondering if the staff report can be changed to reflect the two-year lease time frame. Um, Ms. Jensen, uh, how is that, uh, the lease related to the, um, uh, to the actual uh, bylaw changes? Well, the, the zoning itself would not be contingent upon the lease uh, agreement uh, and any timelines that are set out in the lease agreement. Um, we do have Ms. Bay in attendance as well, if she would like to speak further to the lease agreement. But uh, should the lease change or if the requirements of the lease were amended at some point in the future, Council does have the ability to, to subsequently amend the zoning back to its current RS5 or some other regulations that Council wanted to consider at the time. I think maybe it's worthwhile just for Ms. Bay to give uh, some clarification on that, um, on the uh, on the on the lease and and the, any connection to the zoning. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, the the lease itself uh, is uh, is signed uh, for a time period that would extend until August of 2023. Uh, the zoning uh, is uh, separate from the lease agreement, so. Uh, the uh, the lease agreement will only extend uh, until the time frame set out in the lease, which is to August of 2023. Councillor Braithwaite, is that sufficient, or is there something else you would like? Uh, no, I'm I'm just doing the math in my head. Um, <laughs> the August 2023 is more than two two years from now. So is is it a three year lease, or is it a is it going to be that the lease won't be signed until August of 2021? Um, Ms. Bay, can you just clarify the dates of the lease? Uh, the, the lease is for more than two years. The lease does go till 2023. Okay, so that wasn't my understanding. I thought that the lease was only for two years, but perhaps that's something offline that we can speak of um, because it's not, it has, it doesn't have anything to do with this um, item that's on the agenda right now. Uh, I guess my other question would be in regards to parking. Um, uh, the, the the report mentioned something about parking, but um, it doesn't talk about uh, how many spaces. It says it sets out uh, a minimum number of parking spaces required for land use, um, but it doesn't specifically speak to congregate housing. So is there something that will be coming forward about parking for this property, or is it just going to be that there's going to be three parking spaces within the building, um, within the within the lot space. Uh, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Can you uh, just clarify for us, Ms. Jensen, that what what parking requirements will be part of this zoning? Yes, absolutely. So um, the way our parking bylaw is set up, it only speaks to to parking for congregate housing under the P2 zone, which is an institutional zone. So we look to that as, as a comparison for, for other, uh, other zonings that might have a similar use. In that particular situation, the, the P2 zone, the institutional zone, uh, sets a requirement for three parking spaces for each building of congregate housing, which which doesn't really um, you could you could uh, adjust that accordingly, but really it's looking at three, no matter the number of people that you have under that congregate housing. So we've taken that as our cue under the residential five zoning um, to accommodate three spaces on the site. 
Under the RS5 zoning, they're already providing for that. They have room for outdoor parking spaces as well as the required indoor space. So while the parking has not been formalized in terms of the spaces, they do have ample room to accommodate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, I'm just going to remind anybody at home who wishes to call to call 250-598-3311 if you want to address us on this topic. Uh, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and through you to Ms. Jensen. Um, thank you very much for the report. And this is not a, a question related to zoning per se, um, but do we have any COVID concerns around the concept of congregate housing at this time? Since these, uh, um, so I don't know how we define a family bubble, but I'm, I'm, are there any, are we aware of any precautions being taken as we expand the bubble of separate families or single families or single people, just a concern. And I would be concerned about it for any, any congregate building, but I just wondered if that was um, something that we, we were aware of or needed to be aware of. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Green. It isn't directly related to the zoning, but I'm gonna give that question to Ms. Bay. Where does that responsibility lie uh, in terms of safety plans, et cetera, uh, under, the, under this arrangement? Uh, is it municipal? Is it the, uh, is it the leasee? Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, for that question. Uh, it, it does lie with the uh, with with Verts, who is operating the facility uh, as the as the leaseholder. Uh, they are responsible for preparing safety plans and uh, adhering to uh, all uh, all regulations and, and orders from the province. So uh, there are terms in the lease which uh, specifically set out that they are required to comply with uh, not just municipal bylaws but also provincial and federal laws and regulations. Thank you very much, Ms. Bay. Uh, any other questions? Councillor Zilka? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, thank, uh, uh, thank you uh, through you to, uh, to staff for, uh, for a very complete report. And uh, I'm impressed that uh, the, the desire or the, the, the ability for us to rezone this could be done in such a small uh, amendment to the zoning bylaw uh, by, 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 by a, a simple addition to, uh, to one of the sections in the RS5 uh, zoning. So my, my congratulations on, on how you were able to do that in such a simple way. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that this zoning will um, exist beyond uh, the duration of the uh, lease uh, to, to, to Verks, which uh, allows us to use the building for um, what's been described as affordable housing potentially uh, going forward um, uh, to live on um, so that uh, I'm also wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of the many incredible volunteers and uh, those who have donated such a, a, an amazing amount of in-kind um, work to uh, bring the building up to a uh, spec uh, and and make the uh, the uh, the building useful not only for the uh, the, the works uh, capabilities but uh, but the fact that those um, uh, additions and uh, enhancements will live on beyond the lease. Um, I, I also want to thank staff for not charging us uh, a community amenity contribution. I really appreciate the fact that we don't have to spend uh, money on ourselves with respect to that. Um, I believe the, the uh, volunteers with their in-kind uh, uh, donations have effectively provided that community amenity contribution um, uh, on, on our behalf. So again, thank you very much uh, for this thing. And when, when uh, the appropriate time comes forward, um, maybe after the public has a chance to speak, I'll be glad, the, glad to be willing to move the motion to approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zalka. Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you. Sorry, I rem just remembered I'd forgotten to ask one question. Um, and through you, um, how is the public hearing going to work? Uh, I noticed that in the staff report it says that we'd have a public hearing on January 14th. Um, so I'm not sure how public hearings work in this time of COVID. So if we could have a, perhaps an explanation of how that might come about, um, I think that would be helpful. Sure. Uh, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. I know that's being worked on by staff at the moment in terms of how to do that safely. Uh, Ms. Williams, do we have any uh, update in terms of our plans for that public hearing? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the city will be looking at uh, an electronic participation model for the public hearing, very similar to what's being used in other municipalities in the region and around the province. I personally have been involved in a number of them in, in one of the local municipalities. Uh, so there will be opportunities for people to provide uh, written comments, to log on to the platform and to participate and hear and contribute. 
if we if we get to a point where we feel that uh, we're able to safely accommodate the public, we would certainly look at you know doing that in as much as we can. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, is that contingent upon us having our e electronic doodads in this room updated by that time? Is that one of the one of the uh, one of the conditions of us having meeting that that timeline? Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, the doodads will be important. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a technical term, doodads. Um, are there any questions or any call-ins from members of the public on this agenda item, Ms. Williams? Okay, thank yeah, you very much. Uh, Councillor Zelka? Uh, I'd like to move the recommendation um, to give first and second reading to the amendment bylaw and to set the public hearing date as mentioned in the report. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, so for those watching at home, this is advising ourselves to do this. So this will come before us as council next week if this passes. Uh, and at that point, we would consider the first and second reading and setting of the public hearing date. Um, I'm just looking around. Any other comments? Councillor Appleton, anything you wish to add? No, thank you, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Uh, in that case, I'm happy to call the question. All those in favour? Councillor Appleton? In favour. Any opposed? None opposed. That passes. Thank you very much. And item number four on the agenda, uh, this is the secondary suite study update uh, for information. Um, Ms. Jensen, I believe you're back uh, with us on this agenda item. And we have a, a presentation that was added to the agenda package. For those following at home, you can follow the presentation uh, at the, at, from home. And again, if you wish to call in on this item, uh, and just a reminder, it's just a, an update in terms of a process and, and where we're at, and, uh, but it's a chance for the public to, to call in as well. Uh, the number here, 250-598-3311, 250-598-3311. Uh, Ms. Jensen, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to give Council an update on the secondary suite study. So tonight is really about providing an overview, <clears throat> pardon me, to Council on the process to date where we started and what we've managed to achieve to date. So council last saw information on the secondary suite study in 2019, prior to completion of the housing needs report. And of course the impact that COVID has had on our operations. So as council is aware, staff have been working on the secondary suite study. Uh, it is one of the components that makes up the overall housing framework that is part of council's strategic priorities. To date, we've undertaken background review. Uh, for example, we've looked at the district's plans and policies. We've looked at regulatory environments in other communities. In other words, what works and what doesn't when it comes to regulating secondary suites. We have also undertaken community engagement through open houses, surveys, and pop-up booths. All of this has led to an overall roadmap of what the district could consider as part of the secondary suite strategy and for which we will bring, be bringing forward the draft strategy in December. Some of the items we will be addressing in that draft strategy have been identified in the report you have in front of you tonight, which is a bit of a preview for what you can expect to see next month. Uh, Urban Systems has been contracted to help staff complete the secondary suite study. Dan Wong, who is a principal with Urban Systems, is here tonight to walk Council through the process to date. Uh, you have a bit of a presentation in front of you as well that we'll use to, to guide you through the, the presentation. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jensen, and um, welcome, Mr. Wong. Uh, I understand you're going to be uh, doing a brief presentation here for Council. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm here in Ms. Jensen's office here. Um, uh, good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, my name is Dan Wong. I'm the Senior Planner from Urban Systems Victoria, and I live at uh, 2117 McNeil Avenue here in Oak Bay. Uh, we've been working with the district since 2018 on the Secondary Suites study. As Ms. Jensen notes, um, tonight is a short presentation for Council in, in advance of the draft report as, and it's provided as a refresher update on the scope of our work and items for consideration. Uh, next slide, please. As a backgrounder, the policy rationale for this study came from the 2014 OCP, Housing Policy Number 10, which states, develop a policy and regulatory framework to permit secondary suites as a way of providing affordable housing. The secondary suites study was initiated in 2018 we um, conducted community consultation in spring of 2019 and provided an update to council in May 2019. Further input was obtained 
at the Oak Bay Night Market last summer. The study was placed on hold until completion of the housing needs report, which was completed in February of 2020, and then also then through the rest of 2020 due to COVID-19. We have now resumed our study and expect a draft report back to Council in December of this uh, next month, with further consultation anticipated for January of 2021, and a final strategy report to Council by March of 2021. The next slide, please, is the purpose of tonight's update to Council. So given the time span since the commencement of our project, we're providing this uh, update to Council in advance of the draft report in December for some of your initial feedback. The housing needs report and our previous analysis shows that Oak Bay already has a substantial number of suites, somewhere between 500 and 750 within our community. Consultation to date shows general support for secondary suites, so long as items such as health and safety, parking, infrastructure impacts, owner occupancy, and so forth are addressed. There are challenges and concerns that were raised by the community, which will need to be considered as part of the overall strategy. As a reminder, this study focuses on secondary suites that are within primary residential dwellings only and not suites in accessory buildings like garages or garden suites. Next slide, please. There are a number of considerations that are outlined in the staff report and which will be described in detail in the draft report. A few highlights are provided in the next few slides. The first is new versus existing construction. The provision of new secondary suites aligns with current policy and the housing needs report. This will provide an opportunity to conform with required regulations such as zoning, parking and building code. For existing secondary suites, currently they are unregulated and are identified and addressed on a complaint driven basis. Considering a regulatory program for existing suites would provide an opportunity to comply with district bylaws and regulations as applicable. There must be careful consideration of the policy and regulatory impacts as it may have the opposite outcome, such as increased non-compliance and decreased housing affordability. Next slide, please. There are a number of regulatory considerations that are also outlined in the staff report, along with potential implications. These include the following. Zoning. In order to permit secondary suites, the zoning bylaw will require amendment. Some items for consideration would include lot size, floor area, siting, owner occupancy, and so forth. There's also consideration of potential, potential impacts to staff resources and enforcement, as well as a community education and information program. The next is parking. On-street parking is part of the shared public realm. Based on our analysis and, cons and, and cons consultation within the community, we note that there are parking challenges, but they do vary from street to street. We also note that secondary suites will not necessarily have a direct impact to on-street parking. Finally, many homes, both existing and new construction, would not be able to provide an extra off-street parking space for a secondary suite, and as such could impact the street character, such as the tree canopy. Uh, next slide, please. Another regulatory consideration is licensing. A business licensing program could help to track and manage secondary suites in a community. That said, a number of communities have utilized this process, which we have analyzed in our report, with varying degrees of, of success and compliance. The district would need to take into consideration its resources, including technology and staff. The next consideration for secondary suites is compliance with the BC Building Code. As you know, Oak Bay's housing stock has made it challenging to comply with, BC, uh, with the building code for suites. However, the building, the building code has recently been, been amended to improve the viability of suites, including no size restrictions, reduced ceiling heights down to 1.95 meters, reduced door heights at non-entrances down to 1.89 meters, reduced window and door openings, and reduced fire separation requirements. We're working with district staff and we will provide a detailed overview in the draft report for further discussion with Council in December. Next slide, please. The last consideration in tonight's presentation relates to infrastructure capacity. 
During community consultation, there was concern expressed regarding the impact of secondary suites on existing infrastructure services. While infrastructure modeling continues to be developed, district engineering staff have indicated no concern regarding infrastructure capacity to support secondary suites, given the relatively low household size in Oak Bay at an average of 2.3 per household. Next slide, please. In our report, we've conducted research um, of comparison communities and we have and we'll have a comparison table which includes the following communities the town of sydney the township of esquimalt district of saanich city of chilliwack and the district of west vancouver some of the comparison topics include the community context zoning requirements parking servicing licensing requirements enforcement the experience with legalization in that community and public communications the final slide please so our intent uh, this evening is to have a bit of a discussion and, and as I said, reintroduce this topic to Council and the community. Uh, we will finalize our draft report and present that to Council uh, in December of 2020. Um, we're looking to conduct uh, online community engagement in January of 2021 and then we'll be back to Council with the final report and presentation in March 2021. Following that, implementation is to be determined at the will of Council. Uh, so for tonight's discussion, um, uh, certainly open for any discussion. Ms. Jensen's here as well too. Um, for things like the regulatory or other considerations, are there any other comparison communities um, that Oak Bay would like us to look at and any other discussion at the community's pleasure. So thank you very much for uh, your time this evening and um, look forward to any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wong. And I think we'll have a number of questions. Um, and I guess out of curiosity, you ask us for some of these pieces that we might want to incorporate or consider um, how, I guess you'll let us know here whether or not it's feasible or not to, to add or change the, the scope of the report. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay, thank you very much. I have Councillor Zelka's hand up first, then Councillor Nathan, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Through you to uh, to uh, to staff and and uh, and our wonderful guest. Um, um, not that long ago, um, uh, we passed a motion around the 540 units that are currently uh, classified as legal non-conforming, um, asking um, uh, staff to go away and work on uh, potentially a, a, a strata addition or some, some regulations around strata aspects with respect to these legal and non-conforming to be added to the housing framework. I understand of those 540 units, many of those would be part of this 500 to 750 uh, um, a rental units. I was wondering if, um, if uh, uh, staff or uh, the, the guests could comment on uh, how many of these 500 to 750 would be part of that 540 units that are legal non-conforming, if there's an overlap, how does it, how does it all tie in together? Because I'm, I'm, I'm unclear when um, uh, how that this this uh, ties in with the desire for those um, many units mentioned in the housing needs report that are currently in limbo. Sorry, just for my clarification before I pass it to staff, you're referring primarily to legal non-conforming or typically the duplexes that we have. Is that the primary piece that you're, you're speaking to? Yes, and, and the, the, many of those duplexes probably have um, a secondary suites within them, I, I would imagine. In fact, we do know of one that did. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Jensen, I'll probably give that to you as a uh, as a piece. Do you, do we have a sense of the of the overlap between the legal non-conforming and the and the rough estimates we have for the number of secondary suites? Uh, I think to answer that question, I'll take it in in segments. So, um, Councillor Zelka has mentioned that uh, uh, Council did ask staff to go away and prepare some kind of strata conversion policy. So that is definitely on um, our work plan for completion as part of the overall housing framework. Now, strata conversion um, would typically address multifamily buildings uh, and, and looking at policy around what we would be taking into consideration in addition to the legislation that already directs how we consider those conversions. That strata conversion would not impact um, secondary suites. So you could not you could not stratify a secondary suite, uh, and in fact, even in, within the BC Building Code, they're very uh, they're they're very clear with the regulations that they will not accept a, a secondary suite or a stratification. Uh, in terms of the the other pieces, 
I think council will see us wrapping all of those pieces together as part of the housing framework. So in terms of how it impacts that 540 suites, I don't see um, the stratification necessarily impacting the suites. Go ahead, Councillor Zalka. Uh, thank you. That was that's very very helpful, and thank you for clarifying that uh, we cannot stratify stratify a secondary suite uh, going forward. I uh, appreciate that. Um, uh, next question, if I may, uh, is um, uh, a data analysis was done of some of the BC assessments um, uh, data for Oak Bay that showed, if I remember correctly, 252 houses. Uh, within Oak Bay's uh, housing stock currently have a um, uh, the, the capacity or have two full uh, kitchens within them uh, uh, encompassing uh, uh, each one of having their own stove. Only 252 houses uh, were counted by them um, having that capability. Um, I presume this 500 to 750 number is an estimate that is related to the 252 uh, of houses that can have a legal secondary suite in them uh, or if not could uh, staff clarify. Sure, and I might uh, miss, give that to our guest, Mr. Wong. It, it may just be helpful to all of us to understand uh, the estimates that's being used currently in terms of the number of existing suites, um, how that came about, and, and how, this, uh, how BC assessments uh, numbers play into that. Uh, sorry, it's Deborah here. Maybe if I could just clarify on that. So the, the, uh, num the, the, the estimates that we're providing in terms of number of suites, much of that information is now coming from our approved housing needs report. Uh, in terms of how that ties in with the 252 houses, part of the data that we pull is coming from BC assessment, but all of that information will ultimately tie to uh, any zoning regulations that council may want to put in place as part of the final strategy. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask a question of, as a follow-up to that? How, how I mean, does it does it to Mr. Wong? How does it matter too much in terms of uh, knowing the exact number at this point? Does it help us with enforcement? Like, where is the, the 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 cutoff for for determining how many now versus uh, just putting in regulations and 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 working our way through it? Um, just to your worship, you know, they just. The information is, is not exact, there, there are ranges at this point. I think they just provide a bit of a guide as to an order of magnitude uh, as we go through our analysis. Every community has its share of both regulated and un unregulated suites as well too. So at the end of the day, it's really the framework that council decides uh, to set in motion uh, coming out of the council, uh, out, of the, out of the OCP policy that will then kind of guide the steps towards implementation. Okay. Um, you know, with with uh, with the impacts uh, to both the community, to, to staff, and regulations, uh, it, they're going to be different for each one. So, so it really is just a guide at this point. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Sorry, Councillor Nay, go ahead. And I have Councillor Nay then brief wait. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Through you to um, through to Mr. Wong, actually. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Actually. Um, address many of the questions I had uh, from the report, but just a point of clarification. Um, so is, is the uh, community engagement that was already done in the spring, summer of 2019, is that to be used to inform the, fi the, the next strategy report? Is that the idea? Or, or is that something? The reason I'm asking is, um, it, I, I don't, I don't think we've seen anything yet uh, about, for example, the survey and what the community is thinking about this. You'd said in a very general way that the community is supportive, but I, I don't know that I've seen the questionnaire or what was asked of the community, and I'm just wondering if you could uh, fill me in, unless that is going to be part of the next report in December. Uh, Mr. Wong, not to give away the, the, the report, but uh, can you give us, is that is that detail going to be included in the report? Uh, thank you, Worship. I'm looking at Ms. Jensen and she's, <laughs> uh, she, she will respond to that question. So. Uh, thank you, Sir, Your Worship. Um, yes, we will be providing a lot of that information as part of the, the draft strategy report you're going to see. That report is set up in such a way that you will you will see a lot of the background information with the appendices, ultimately leading through 
to some of the key points that are mentioned in the in the in the staff report that you have in front of you tonight and then ultimately how how council can can use that information going forward okay thank you and uh through you mayor to to staff again given uh the recent building code um uh amendments that there's uh as i understand it no size restrictions how will that be how do you anticipate that be dealt with Mr. Wong or Ms. Jensen? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. That, that ultimately will be a consideration not only as part of health and safety, but also um, as to our, our, any zoning regulations that, that Council may wish to put into place. Okay. Um, and just a couple questions in terms of um, the process going forward. So if I've understood... Um, what's being reported to us here is that we'll receive a report in uh, December and then based on that discussion and what council decides, we'll be going out to an online engagement. So what's, what are we engaging about at that point? Mr. Wong? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so very, uh, you know, the, the the issues that were identified this evening will be further detailed in the report. There are pros and cons of each of those uh, of those regulatory considerations as as introduced in tonight's presentation. Um, those will be things that uh, will be reviewed by council in the report in December, and then we will go to the community and just find out you know how do they feel about some of those potential implications. There may be some trade offs uh, for consideration. This is not. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a, a straightforward conversation to have, and that's why it's taken, you know, a number of years and, and multiple conversations to, to get to this point. And every community has to look at um, what its needs are, um, uh, how it feels about secondary suites, and what some of those trade-offs are uh, with respect to parking, with respect to regulations, with respect to, um, you know, the, the, the street features, um, it's, uh, and with respect to owner occupancy. And so in every community, um, there, there are, there, you know, those discussions will help to inform um, uh, our final report as we come back to council, and then council in March will then have to decide which ones of those potential trade-offs or regulatory considerations does it want to see move forward into a more into our holistic strategy for secondary suites. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just, um, I, I am questioning some of the time uh, issues. It, it's not a question of you, Mr. Wong. It's just, uh, we have been working on this for quite a few years now. So the next question I have is, um, uh, we receive, a, I guess this may be to Ms. Jensen through you, Mayor. Um, so we'll receive uh, the report Council receives the strategy in December. It goes out to uh, consult with the community. A report is written, comes back to us in December. So at that point, uh, how far away are we to work towards um, the zoning, a zoning bylaw in secondary suites after council? Let's presume uh, th there's a consensus at the, the council table to move forward. How far away would we be at that point? Uh, I'll give that to Ms. Jensen probably for our internal timelines. And I don't, just for anybody watching, that's a, it's not a presumption probably, but it's it's a fair question in terms of where this fits into our overall housing framework question and those timelines as well. Ms. Jensen? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So to to go back to the, the timeline that was set out in the report, Yes, we are looking at community consultation in January, followed by bringing back the final um, strategy to council in March. Uh, but following that, it really will hinge on council direction as to how they want to proceed with the recommendations that are set out in that report. Um, we do have Mr. Anderson on the line as well. He might want to add something into that. It's nice to have everybody together, uh, if it only virtually. Uh, Mr. Anderson, welcome. Did, any, did you want to add anything else to the conversation? Yeah, if I may, Your Worship, thank you. Uh, what I, I did want to say is that uh, the, the results of the, the secondary suites will give us some, some direction that we may wish to take as a community regarding implementing uh, regulations and policies for secondary suites. Uh, we'll have that in place. We'll have that in our in our hands, if you will, as a, of, let's say, the March timeframe. Um, as you're aware, we're also wanting to go forward and look at our neighborhoods and look at housing options 
in our neighborhoods and that would include looking at duplexes and and also detached suites and, and other housing forms what we may wish to do is, is work our way through that process and then pull all of the results of, of the potential actions to implement for different housing types into uh, a set of directions to change the zoning bylaw, for example, at that time. Um, the other option the council would have is, is to give some direction following receipt of the secondary suite strategy and direction to staff to go ahead and start implementing uh, zoning changes sooner with the secondary suite. So I think we have a couple of choices in terms of how we go ahead and implement on secondary suites. I hope that's helpful. Well, um, it, it sounds like uh, that's kind of a new story to me, uh, Mr. Anderson, through you, Mayor, um, because we this uh, this this uh, motion came forward quite separate from that and has been um, researched and consulted with the community separate from that. And I, I'm not quite sure why we would be looking at uh, if I've understood you correctly as an option to delay that and wait till we've completed the other part of the housing framework. I, I, that's, I'm just wondering why that's come up here. Uh, Mr. Anderson, you can answer that. I might be able to answer part of that question as well. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, I think given that we've, we've uh, sort of uh, got direction to start looking at other housing options, uh, I just wanted us to to know that in terms of putting together a housing framework that gives us some potential actions to implement on our housing options, that that, that direction to, to put the, the suites implementation into the context of implementing the other housing types is an option for council's consideration. As I said, council can also, with receipt of the secondary suite study, give staff direction to go ahead and start implementing the zoning changes sooner. That That's... Um, I guess the context here is that we are working toward a housing framework that's gonna look at a range of housing types that might be available in our community and how we implement that. Councilor Nate, does that answer the question? No, yeah, that's fine for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'll just probably add two cents to that is that the, um, I think the intention here is that we have a housing needs report. We know we have some some missing housing options in the community. Uh, suites are one of those potential housing options, but there's a number of other ones as well. And I, I think the intention here is that if we can get to a holistic look at how do we address the needs uh, and be a little bit more agnostic in terms of the form uh, and, and trying to find the best forms to meet the needs, then that's the goal. Um, so I think as long as we can stick to our timelines here of this coming year, completing that process and having all the housing forms, that's the goal. It would also include uh, the multifamily as well, I think is the intention of that to some of the, the village areas that so we can we can look at this from a, for how do we tackle our housing needs more broadly. Um, um, and I'm just gonna go in my order here, sorry. I have Councillor Braithwaite, Patterson, and then Green. Um, thanks so much, um, and through you, uh, Mayor, to staff. Um, I'm looking at the staff report um, from Ms. Jensen, and um, just to kind of tag on to a couple of things that Councillor Nay was talking about, um, and it would be on the last, on page five. Ms. Jensen, the very top paragraph, it talks about the online platform, um, and I'm one like for public engagement, and I'm wondering if that's gonna be the only platform that we'll be using, and the reason I ask that question is because I'm, um, I'm aware that some people might not want to or be able to uh, use an online platform, and it, would there be any um, availability for people to who can't use online platforms to also have input. Um, I'll give it to either Ms. Jensen or Mr. Wong. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, absolutely. I, I've mentioned Bang the Table because that is one of the platforms that the district has been using. Uh, absolutely, we will provide uh, opportunity for anybody who doesn't have the ability to use an on online platform to provide comments as well. Uh, we have done that in the past with the other ones as well, where people had an opportunity to provide comments, drop them off at the district so that we could actually uh, see that as well, and those were incorporated into our review. So, yes. Perfect, thank you. And then also on your report on page three, um, under point number two, existing secondary suites, um, in the second paragraph, it's talking about regulatory programs for existing secondary suites 
um, and seeking compliance with the district bylaws. Then it goes on to say that it could range from voluntary compliance to required compliance and enforcement. And where compliance is not feasible, new policies could provide an, for an alternate approach. So can would that be a, an alternate approach but still within what the building code guidelines would be? Um, Ms. Jensen? Yeah, I think I'll hand that one over to, to Mr. Anderson since he's also a uh, director for bylaw enforcement. Go ahead, Mr. Anderson. Uh, there's the mute. There we Sorry go. About that. Um, yeah, so the, the, the opportunities uh, when we look at existing uh, secondary suites uh, regulation, um, as, as noted in the report, they do range from from uh, seeking voluntary to to actually uh, pursuing bylaw enforcement, uh, what I think community's experiences are is that if you're seeking full uh, compliance, um, there are definitely uh, resource and and I guess time and cost issues associated with with that. And in the context of if we have, for example, up to 750 existing suites, I mean that would certainly be something substantial if we were to engage in in sort of uh, seeking um, an enforcement as opposed to voluntary compliance. Not sure if that got the nub of the question or not. Uh, yeah, I think so, thank you. Um, and then I have two more questions and they um, are basically from the PowerPoint. They came up from the PowerPoint. Um, and my first question would be um, on the slide that talks about regulatory considerations and parking. Um, I'm a little bit confused because the two second points, and one, one point says parking challenges vary from street to street. Secondary suites will not necessarily have a direct impact on street parking. And then the next point says many homes existing and new would not be able to provide uh, on extra off street parking space for a secondary suite and could impact the street character. So I, I is that, that just didn't really make sense to me. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could explain that to me. Sure, I'll give that to Mr. Wong, I think. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, through you, so there are, there are two components, are the on-street parking and then the off-street parking. So I'll start with the latter first, actually. So some communities um, require uh, in their zoning bylaws that if you have a secondary suite, uh, you're required to have one additional off-street parking space, uh, which uh, in some communities also is not, uh, cannot be tandem uh, to the existing um, parking. So you would have to provide a second uh, or potentially a third parking space uh, beside. Um, some of the houses uh, in the community um, don't necessarily have space to provide that. Um, if it's in the front yard, some may have it in the backyard. Uh, if they don't have it in the front yard, uh, then they would have to potentially expand their driveway uh, in accordance with regulations or potentially have impact on uh, vegetation and or the tree canopy. So that's the off street parking space. So that is a consideration uh, for, for council if they choose to implement a secondary suite program, would they require an extra off-street parking space uh, as part of the secondary suite? And like I say, some communities do, uh, many communities do not. And so that is a consideration. Um, if they do not require that off-street parking space uh, and that's the suite um, uh, inhabitor has a vehicle, then, that, then they would then park on the street. And so that's where the on-street parking uh, comes into play and that's uh, the first, this, the, the other bullet point then being um, if uh, council decides that they, they do not require an extra off street parking space, uh, there may be room on the street uh, if that secondary suite has uh, a vehicle. And some suites, some, some inhabitors do, some don't. Um, you know, if you're close to transit, um, you, you may not have to have a vehicle. Um, and so, for, and for some of those uh, existing suites that are in the community, um, those impacts are already seen uh, on the street itself. So hope that uh, uh, clarifies the difference between the off-street parking regulations and then the impact on the on-street. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I did understand that. I was just wondering, I mean, the comment that it doesn't necessarily have a direct impact on on-street parking, I, I tend to disagree with, but whatever, that'll, that's for another time. Um, my next question would be uh, also around regulator, regulatory considerations and uh, it has to do with infrastructure. Um, and the second bullet point there said there's no concern regarding infrastructure capacity. And I'm wondering if you can just touch on whether that's uh, road and pipe infrastructure or if that also includes protective services like police and fire infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Wong? 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, through your worship, I'm just going to jump in here a little bit. So, so as part of this overall program, we have been having staff workshops as well to 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 garner input from from any departments that would be impacted by by the possibility of implementing secondary suites. So, to date, and comments from the public, we have been looking at situations such as. Um, uh, garbage and sewer and water and so on and and that's that's what we're referring to in terms of that infrastructure component thank you for the clarification thank you council president i would just point out if there's points like that you think should be highlighted in the report this is the you, we can make these asks that we're not we're not we don't have the report yet but if there's questions uh, of those sorts that, that people want to see uh, i.e. consideration of hazard in other, in, in other jurisdictions impacts on, on policing infra resources or other things. That would be probably uh, a reasonable ask to make of this. And, uh, and that's kind of where I was going. So yes, I, w I would like to see um, something like that outlined in the report. So I'll just, to Mr. Wong, is that, uh, that um, in the interest that is coming back in December, is that within the scope that you think you could include some uh, and if there's any, uh, you know, I guess probably impacts in other jurisdictions on sort of more human uh, infrastructure, uh, the police, fire, uh, bylaw enforcement type side of the equation. Uh, it is your worship. Okay, thank you. So let's let's include that as well, since we might as well have as much information as possible. I have councillor. Is that it, councillor? Uh, <laughs> councillor <Okay>. Braithwaite. <laughs> I looked down and I had my list, and <laughs> Councillor Zelka was on the top of my list. So my apologies. Uh, are you is that a satisfactory, Councillor Braithwaite? Okay, thank you, Councillor Patterson, and Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'm just checking down my list. A lot of these questions have already been asked by my, my colleagues around the table. Um, I thank staff and all concerned for for the reports they provided. Um, one thing that I am wondering if it will be included in the report that comes forward in December. Um, and that is a bit of the business planning elements, and I know that it's difficult and, and, and it could be a lot of work to um, try and, and work out a detailed business plan until you really have um, agreement around the council table as to how we want to proceed. But I, I guess um, as, I, as I look at this, um, we are in pandemic, so... It's not the most opportune time to be trying to undertake this, and so there, there, I expect that there will be some uh, barriers to how how you would normally carry out this process. But on page three and four of the, re the report, um, under number one and number three, it does talk about implications of zoning and licensing and the potential to require additional resources. So I would think that there will be some uh, cost considerations there that council will want to consider um, with this framework report that we're going to get uh, so that we have an understanding of it and also a, a clearer understanding of what, Im what the implementation would look like. If you have to have people going in and doing inspections, uh, right now that can be complicated enough just to get occupancy for buildings. So I'm sure if they're already occupied buildings, there's uh, higher costs relative to just how you would, how you would really roll out this program. Um, so a lot of considerations, and what I'm hoping will come forward in the report is just kind of a high-level detail of, of things that council will need to be aware of, um, particularly as it will help to inform strategic planning and financial planning for 2021. Um, we did have uh, quite a, a very good detailed Q3 report from our director of finances. Um, just a couple meetings back and so we we know that there are some challenges this year because of revenues being down and some of our, our costs being up and and staff have been doing an incredible job here trying to trying to deal with all of that but I would think that there we would experience some higher costs in um, trying to undertake this at this time. So if these things could become, could be rolled into the report, I think that would really help us uh, in our planning for next year as a council. 
Thank you, Councillor Patterson. I, what I heard there was a, a list I, I thought I heard was, was going to be included uh, in the report. Uh, Mr. Wong, was there anything there that raised a red flag that would not be included in the, in the general report coming to us in December? Uh, not really, Your Worship. I mean, it, it is, it, it, I, I, I hate to say the word, it depends, uh, because it really depends on how you choose to implement as well, too. So uh, other communities um, in the comparisons will have different experiences of how they have uh, implemented and, and how they implement then uh, determines uh, the level of um, regulata regulation, staffing and enforcement requirements. And so, so, so I think you'll, you'll see a, a, um, a range uh, from various communities, and that will probably help inform the discussion as you move forward for okay. both the community and for council. Okay, thank you. Councillor Patterson? Yes, and just one last question. Um, we talked about the infrastructure, uh, and certainly, you know, I don't see that this would put an extra burden on the infrastructure per se, but we have, as again, part of the Q3 reports and, and uh, uh, what we what we have heard from our uh, staff on asset management, we know that in areas of very aging infrastructure, there have been a number of repairs required for, for lines. And although secondary suites do not necessarily have to be in basements, I think uh, many of them are, in fact, in basement locations. And I'm just wondering if there um, will be any commentary in the report about the aging infrastructure and things that the municipality may want to um, be aware of as we are planning this, and particularly in uh, perhaps areas where our infrastructure is most aged um, and where there might be a higher risk potentially of any breakdown in service lines um, and how that might um, want to how owners may want to consider that in any planning they have if they wanted to have suites in their in their houses. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. I have uh, Councillor Green. Uh, before I go to second time speakers, uh, Councillor Appleton, did you wish to speak at all? I'll go to you, I'll, I'll reach out to you next after Councillor Green if if you have any comments okay. or questions. This is coming off of you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you for the presentation and the reports. Um, just for Mr. Anderson, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Anderson, just a question on timelines, and I, I'm feeling just a little bit confused. Can you remind me about the timelines that were identified for the housing plan for re revision of the zoning bylaw and uh, the review of secondary suites? And the only reason I'm asking this question is that the zoning bylaw is referenced a couple of times in in Ms. Jensen's report, um, and I just I remember that we had this discussion some months ago now, perhaps last year, in fact, and it would help me to understand the implications for timing around uh, zoning, the, you know, the zoning bylaw that would re that would regulate secondary suites, and then the timelines for the overall housing plan of which secondary suites is an element. So could, could you refresh me on timelines? Uh, because I notice um, on page two of Ms. Jensen's report, uh, phase three, issues and opportunities, I didn't see any dates or content for phases three. Um, and phase four is the draft strategy with online engagement. Um, so I just wondered if, if we could talk about timelines again that would be helpful for me thank you uh, thank you I just for clarification those phases are for the secondary suites study not for the housing framework study that you're referring to in here correct okay just to make sure everybody's on the same page on that mr. Anderson uh, yes uh, through you, your worship thank you councillor green for that question uh, one thing I'll, I'll just say right up the top uh, when you're referring to the zoning bylaw and as a as an initiative that's um, a comprehensive review and update of our zoning bylaw that's anticipated to commence in 2022 just so you know for our comprehensive zoning bylaw update with respect to uh, the components of our housing framework secondary suites being one of them uh, the neighborhood housing options uh, referred to as infill or uh, missing middle housing um, is another component 
and then uh, village area plans that have multifamily or multi-unit residential components are, is, is another element of that housing framework. So the, uh, the secondary suites, uh, we can have the, the information wrapped, as we said, in March of next year. We can be working, as we've indicated, on the neighborhood housing options over the course of 2021 and, and have uh, something in place for council to consider direction on in terms of any zone changes by the end of, of next year. And then the village area plans are anticipated to take a little bit longer, but move us into uh, 2022, perhaps where we can get some direction on making changes to zoning with respect to that component of the housing framework. So we have basically, uh, if you will, a staggered set of components of the housing framework that we're working on. Each of those would cause, if council directs, some changes to be made to the zoning bylaw. We can do that uh, individually, as I've mentioned. The suites are done. We get direction to change the zoning bylaw. We do that. Or we can do these as part of uh, a comprehensive change to the zoning bylaw and implement those as part of that um, zoning bylaw update. So there's kind of two options for us in terms of the approach we take. Councilor Green? Yes, thank you. Very good. You're still taking questions, so I'll, I, I have comments later. Is that? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Councillor uh, Appleton, did you have uh, questions? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, just two quickly uh, for staff or for Mr. Wong. Uh, just in terms of information that might be coming forward in the, uh, in the December report uh, and desirable information, I'm just wondering whether or not demographic information is available on secondary suite op occupants. So whether or not we have information that could be provided about who's, you know, I, I'm not even sure whether such information exists, but I think some context about, um, you know, who typically occupies secondary suites in, in residential zones is, would be potentially useful. So I'm not, I'm not sure whether that's available or plausible. Mr. Wong, is it, is, do we have that information available to us to include? Um, uh, through your worship, uh, not uh, directly from either BC assessment or Canada census. That's, that's uh, because suites are currently unregulated right now. It's not really a question that uh, comes up. There were a few questions that we did ask anonymously through our consultation process, which may give a bit of a, uh, a flavor uh, of who might be living in a secondary suite uh, or their tenants, um, including you know, whether they're a post-secondary student or not, um, whether they own a vehicle or not. And so those types of questions were asked uh, in the anonymous uh, consultation in, in 2019. Um, I see Ms. Jensen looking at the housing needs report to see if there's anything in there necessarily that uh, aligned with the secondary suites, but um, I'll turn it over to her. There are any. Yeah, thank you. So, so really this, the, the way uh, the census information works is, is that they are looking um, essentially at primary rental units. So we can pull information um, for those dwelling units that are considered to be formal rental. So for example, an apartment building that's been constructed purely for rental. That information is not so easy to obtain when we're talking about secondary suites. So unfortunately, it's a bit difficult to be able to pull that demographic information other than what Mr. Wong indicated already in terms of any uh, anything we could glean from the, um, the the engagement that we did earlier. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Just just for clarification on that point, your worship, through you, um, not I, I should have been more clear. Not necessarily focused exclusively on the demographics of uh, the folks who are living in suites in Oak Bay currently but whether or not there also might be comparative information from uh, neighbor municipalities or other CRD municipalities uh, who have moved forward with regulation and might have some uh, data on, uh, on the demographics of secondary suite occupants. Mr. Wong, is that available at all? Um, if, it's, if it's available through census and if it's a legalized suite, then Possibly it's something that we can extract. It wasn't something that was in our community comparison. Um, it, uh, given the timeline, we wouldn't be able to add it in December, but it's something that we can look at as we move through this process uh, through to March. We can certainly um, do a little bit more analysis and research in the comparison communities to see if there's anything that we can glean 
uh, prior to the March final report. Okay, well, we can talk a lot at the meeting in December and see where we're at in terms of additional information required. Um, go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Yeah, just one more thing, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, I was just just wanting to confirm that the December report um, will will again contain comparative information with some uh, some adjacent municipalities and some regional municipalities that were mentioned and some uh, other municipalities for comparison. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not data specifically on on the prevalence of owner occupancy, uh, the requirement for owner occupancy was going to be included in that. Uh, Mr. Wong? Yes, yes. I don't know if you heard that, uh, Councillor Appleton, but the answer is yes, it is. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, and is there, I guess uh, that's it for new speakers. So I have a second round here of <laughs> Councillor Nee and then Councillor Zelka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Councilor. Mayor. Um, and through you, Mayor, uh, to, to uh, Mr. Wong, actually, or to staff, I guess. Um, so this has to do with information in the report. Uh, two questions. One of you partly answered, I, I want to know whether the survey done in 2019 was anonymous, and you said it was. And I'm also wondering if the online engagement will also be anonymous, and that, um, you know, people will be responding. I, I, I don't know how they'll be responding, but will it be clear that uh, responses are anonymous? And if they are, then how does that get managed about people from within the un community um, um, responding. But, but my main concern here is that uh, sometimes people who have a suite feel nervous about participating in the consultation for being exposed when there's not yet a regulation. So I, I really wanted to ask whether there will be assured anonymity in the online engagement to ensure that we get full participation, cross-section of participation. Thank you, Councillor uh, Nay. Uh, Mr. Wong? Uh, Deborah here. Oh, I think we Ms. might Jensen. be answering this one. Um, but to, to Councillor Nay's point, yes, we do consider anonymity through this process to be extremely important, and we spent a lot of time looking at that when we initiated the first round of public engagement. Uh, again, we have not formally set what our online engagement is going to look like yet. We are working on that currently, and we will definitely be taking a look at how, um, how we can incorporate anonymity into that. We may be looking at several different... Um, techniques that we can use. Some of those may have more anonymity than others. Okay, thank you. And the second question, Mr. Mayor, um, th to staff. Um, there was a newsletter that was circulating today um, making a um, association between uh, secondary suites and uh, COVID risk. And um, I... I <laughs> I don't know if that's something that could be included in the staff report, but um, it would be useful to either confirm or dispel that association that has been made in some of the community literature. Sure, I'll, I'll just leave that with Mr. Wong for net, for December. If they can, if you can have any just uh, touch on that as part of the presentation or something, that would be that would be good. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, then now, Councillor, if I might uh, as well, uh, uh, Councillor Nee's point about the uh, the anonymity. Uh, the flip side of that is people also want to know how geographically contained things are, so we don't get you know 500 inputs from outside of the community as well. We have some way of measuring the. the it's always this tr tricky part, so I think that's the other half of that equation. I have Councillors uh, Zelka Green and then Braithwaite. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you for the second the opportunity to speak a second time. Um, the The report on page two suggests that um, the study has progressed through phase three, and we're now on to phase four um, uh, is currently underway. And I understand the um, the pandemic has, of course, thrown timelines uh, uh, to the wind in some ways, and I, I can I, I absolutely appreciate that. Um, but I did want to ask, in particular, with respect to reporting out, I do notice that the, like even the reports that are added as uh, appendices to this. 
There's one report from December 2018 from Urban Systems. Another re second report is April 2019, which appeared to fees, uh, um, a feed into the phase two community context uh, work uh, with respect to open houses, surveys, and pop-up booths. Um, I just wanted to ask, is the report that we're going to be seeing next month, is it phase, basically the phase three issues and opportunities report? And if not, when will we see issues and opportunities formalized, uh, since I have a lot of issues and looking forward to opportunities? Thank you, Councillor Zalka. We all have lots of issues. Um, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Wong, do you, uh, where, where are we in these phases? Uh, through your worship, um, uh, through Councillor Zalka, yes, the, the phase three, re uh, the report actually is uh, is actually phase four draft 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 report, and so that will include uh, all of the work to date, uh, all of the issues and opportunities uh, which were highlighted in tonight's presentation and the staff report, uh, and those implications for for council to review uh, in the draft strategy. So so by December, um, if council receives that draft report. Um, that's essentially kind of the draft report to take out to the community uh, and then moving into phase five, which would be kind of receiving that and moving into what your final strategy would be. So so, so the report would be a combination of the issues and opportunities, um, the implications and a draft and a draft strategy. Uh, th that's very helpful because I did have a sort of a similar concern raised by um, by Councillor Green around phase three. There appeared to be sort of a, a, a an empty space there with respect to dates and public participation. So uh, it sounds like the report is going to be a combination of those two. So while we'll have a chance to drill down on issues and opportunities, I presume in December when that report comes forward. That's correct. Uh, it's helpful to know. Thank you very much. Um, so I did want to ask uh, a couple more questions, um, uh, uh, just uh, touching on something that Councillor um, uh, Patterson uh, uh, made reference to, because I, I, I'll admit I was very uh, rather um, confused with this report, because I wasn't quite sure what we're approving if we just receive it, since you, you, uh, 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 reference is made to how additional resources are needed. Can I clarify that no additional resources are needed in this budget cycle for this fiscal year? Uh, Ms. Jensen or Mr. Anderson? Uh, for, sorry, yeah, just, just to clarify. So tonight's report was really just to, to bring council up to speed in terms of where we're at with the secondary suite study. So we're not um, requesting any additional resources at this point in time. There's, there's no direction from council to um, move forward with implementation of secondary suites at this time. Rather, we're working our way through the study. So tonight's report is just to, to bring council up to speed, let you know r roughly what we've heard from the community so far, present some of the issues that have been identified, and then all of that information you'll get in much more depth in December. Uh, I very much appreciate that, but I do also appreciate that for historical purposes, uh, as, meant, as will be mentioned and detailed in uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, because our minutes don't capture uh, any nuance to the discussion that we're having right now, um, uh, if we receive this report, for information, um, it, 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 it appears that we're essentially um, ag agreeing with everything that's, that's within the report. And uh, I, I just want to want to point out that I have some concerns with some of the things that are mentioned in the report. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, when, there, when the motion comes forward, I I'm, I'm, I'm just want you to know that I'm, I'm uncomfortable with what I am agreeing to going forward. So I just want to sort of just sort of put that out there, which is why I appreciate you giving me a chance or giving a, a giving you a chance to clarify what is it you're actually asking us to approve here, if anything. Thank you. And, and just to be clear, we're not approving anything tonight. This is entirely okay. an informational piece to give us just the chance, uh, as Councillor Braithwaite did on the one item, to ask if there's some additional information that would be helpful in our consideration of the pros and cons in December. Uh, that's the goal here tonight. So we're getting a little down into some rabbit holes, but I think it's well, helpful to get clarity on these concerns so that the, uh, the Mr. Wong and others can understand, you know, what, what might be coming up at the topic of conversation. And, so and I don't mind it. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, and I mean, December will be here in two weeks. So I, so this is a, a, a preview of something that's happening in two weeks' time, which, which I, I, I appreciate uh, having a heads up. Um, but uh, if, if this is an opportunity to, to say what I would like to see in a report coming forward, the whole aspect of health and safety, um, 
uh, the, the new building, uh, BC Building Code speaks, makes uh, uh, great strides to provide alternate compliance standards. I would very much like to see what some examples of those look like in the context of Oak Bay. What are alternate compliance standards available uh, and what could be done and what has been done in other jurisdictions that uh, with respect to addressing health and safety, in particular, of course, for those existing secondary suites that would um, uh, uh, allow um, uh, Oak Bay um, uh, citizens to continue to be comfortable with uh, the ambiance, the streetscape, the, uh, the, the parking and, and, and the, the, uh, the tree canopy and all those other aspects. Um, uh, so I, I would very much look forward to seeing a, just like good solid examples as, of what that looks like. Uh, that's something I would, I would definitely like to see in the report come forward. Is that possible? Uh, thank you, Councilor Zelka. I, my read of this is that is what is coming uh, in December. Um, but in terms of the health and safety portion of it, uh, Mr. Wong, perhaps you could just be clearer in terms of what uh, what comparators are included and, and what, what issues are covered within that health and safety portion of the secondary suite study. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, through to uh, Councilor Zelka's question, yes, you know, we're working with staff and, and, the, and the building inspector to, to provide a bit more detail and clarity on um, you know, what's the experience been in the past uh, with the building inspector and the regulations and what some of those new changes might look like. So, so I'm, I'm just reviewing that right now with staff and, and we know that that's an area that we needed to expand as part of the draft report. And so that's currently why we're doing that at this point and, and why we're asking for a couple more weeks to form, you know, to finalize that into our draft report. So, um, so we are looking at those compliance standards and working with staff to, to provide some of those good examples. Thank you, Mr. Wong. That's Zelka. excellent. I'll, I'll, I'll try and, and summarize my final points as quickly as I can. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, you know, that you've separated new secondary suites from existing. The new secondary suite sounds like it'll be fairly straightforward with respect to uh, our zoning bylaws. I know other jurisdictions have, have met great success in that area, and other jurisdictions have had have, have very mixed success with respect to existing secondary suites. So I look forward to um, whatever urban systems is, is able to come up uh, with in that area that would be appropriate for Oak Bay. Um, so, uh, with respect to some considerations, I appreciate you um, uh, uh, clarifying that it will be owner occupancy is the uh, suggestion that's going to be with, re with respect to regulatory considerations. Will the same owner occupancy also help to control potential for Airbnbs to be used in these secondary suites? Will there be any mention of that or is that you know, something independent? Uh, Mr. Wong, does the report touch on uh, short-term vacation rentals as, as, as a topic in this, or is it entirely just focused on residential secondary suites? Uh, no, Your Worship, it does not. Just, it's just the use uh, with respect to the secondary suite itself, uh, you know, as, as the regulation. So I look to Ms. Jensen for clarification. Yeah, if I, if I could follow up on that. Um, again, the, the zoning bylaw currently does not allow short-term rentals in Oak Bay. So this study is really focusing on um, the use, the form of housing within the community. The zoning bylaw is very clear that short-term rental is not permitted at this time. And uh, the last point I wanted to point out, uh, I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to ask about, uh, since this is uh, hopefully going to be in place for a number of years, uh, and we've just received the sea level rise report, uh, and since many secondary suites are often in basements, I was just wondering whether the sea level rise will be factored in in some ways with respect to going forward policies. Thank you. Okay, I'll go, um, perhaps Ms. Jensen can answer that. I, ha I think I know the answer, but go ahead, Ms. Jensen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, sea level rise, no, is not is not part of this study. We will definitely be um, bringing something forward to Council regarding the sea level rise study that was recently completed by the Capital Regional District, of which uh, Oak Bay was, was partnered to. Um, I think at that time you'll see, if, if depending on um, how Council responds to that information, whether you want to take additional steps. Now that would affect not just secondary suites, but, but building in general. But that's a little bit further down the road. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Ms. Jensen, and thank you, Councillor Zelka. I have Councillor Green, Braithwaite, and Patterson. I just cognizant of the time here as well, so if uh, we can make comments uh, reasonably quick here, so we can move on to the other items on the agenda. Um, but uh, speak your mind. Go ahead, Councillor. I will uh, be Green. brief. I will speak my mind. <clears throat> First of all, full disclosure: I I do support the regulation of secondary suites, and I have for ten years since moving here. I also came from a community that didn't have regulated suites and we piloted them and that community now is fully blanketed 
through uh, with regulated suites. So that's North Saanich. Um, I'm hoping in the report coming forward in December that you will touch on the parking issue um, because, uh, um, and I respect the comments of my, my colleagues here, but I, I'm not convinced that um, basement suites and renters, in fact, create the whole problem around parking. For instance, I have neighbors who have three and four vehicles, um, one or two parked in their driveways and the rest on the street. So I, I think we should be careful about making assumptions around parking. So I would hope for some you know, good information. The other one that I would be interested in is the heritage conversion concept. Um, secondary suites are a good way to preserve heritage homes, large ones, and so um, I think that would be an interesting uh, aspect. I also know in speaking with the Heritage Commission some weeks ago, they are concerned about off-street parking regulations because they would like to see less paving and more green space and, and preserving green space in Oak Bay. So that's just something that might be, might be touched upon. I also um, wanted to say that secondary, secondary suites do provide the least impact in terms of densification. They blend into existing houses and neighborhoods, and that's the whole idea. And they are far less intrusive than some of the large homes and um, new homes that we see now. So I think there's some very important aspects of secondary suites that should be explored, owner occupation being another. And um, I would appreciate any information that the, the next stage of the report can provide on, on, on the various aspects of secondary suites. And I would particularly like to know, as Councillor Zalka wants to know, what are the opportunities as opposed to the barriers and the negatives, what are the, um, what are the positives that, that this form of housing provides to communities? Because I know there, there, are, there are positive aspects, there are concerns and they're legitimate as well. And back to um, Councillor Braithwaite's point about the online survey, I think online surveys are great, but I would also ask that perhaps there could be hard copy survey material available through the library through the Monterey Centre and places like that, because my concern is people not online or not computer literate or don't have access to computers will be unable to participate. And I think it's important that we get as much participation as we can for that next survey. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Green. And I just want to make sure we're not getting to a point of advocating for or against suites at this point. We just are coming up for this thing. So uh, let's keep make sure we're careful in our comments. Councillor Braithwaite and Councillor Patterson. Um, thank you. And just um, going um, back to the online survey, um, and, and Mayor, you brought up that um, there w should be a way that we can tell if it's from outside of Oak Bay or inside Oak Bay. I also would like to know um, if there's... Uh, if there's going to be a way to tell whether more than one survey is completed per household. I think we were able to do that on a, on a previous survey, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, anybody, anybody on staff, uh, but I think we were able to do that on a, a survey that we put out before, it might have been on budget or something like that, where we could tell that only one, um, uh, one uh, survey was filled out per machine, I guess it would be per household. Uh, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, uh, Ms. Williams, I'm not sure if who here would be familiar enough with Bang the Table to be able to articulate the, uh, the limitations of that platform, but it's probably a little bit off our topic here tonight. In any case, I think it's, it's we can flag it as a concern, but th that survey would be coming up following the meeting in December once it's approved. But do we know the answer off the top? Uh, no, Your Worship, but we don't, but we could certainly pass that along to our communications staff. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, and I have Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to staff. I just, um, this is a follow-up to something that Councillor Zalka mentioned, and it was understanding what um, the expectation was for Council in receiving this report tonight. There have been some very, very good comments, I think, offered around the Council table tonight. I would, I would certainly appreciate if in addition to this report, we could perhaps just uh, get um, an appendix list to attach to this of what staff heard just to compile the comments that we've received tonight so that we, we just have it as a, as a checklist that we can look at and keep in mind so that when it comes out in December or if, 
if perhaps there's something that we, we find that we think should be on there and wasn't, that we'll be able to respond to it prior to the next report. Okay, thank you, Council Patterson. I'm not sure the mechanism for which to do that. Um, the report is coming, and our, is our chance here is to look at that list and get them feedback to make sure they're included. Um, uh, I'll turn to staff. Is there, is there any mechanism here by which we're keeping a checklist to kind of bring that back to the next meeting, or is that essentially on us to, to manage that? Ms. Rilla? Uh, the minutes, I believe, will reflect that, Your Worship, and uh, staff also has the live stream to look back and review. Anything else, Councilor Patterson? Okay, thank you. Uh, I have just a couple comments, and I'll go to the public if anybody wishes to call in. Again, the number 250-598-3311. Um, but I just a comment first. I think a, a thank you, Mr. Wong uh, and staff, to uh, for bringing this forward, just for our, uh, just giving us the opportunity to provide some feedback on that report. Um, I think it's really important here that that report is giving us uh, that list of opportunities and challenges. Uh, and and some of the pitfalls and, and successes that other jurisdictions have found. Uh, I think the hope here is that as we consider this housing option amongst other housing options that when we implement it and how we implement it and where we implement it makes sense to the community and this is uh, a, a good way of, of managing that process. I had one question which is just on the um, I've heard that one of the the un unintentional side effects of, of uh, legalizing secondary suites is uh, on older ho housing stock and the potential of losing those stocks as people tear down older homes to build larger homes that can put in suites as, as mortgage helpers. And I'm wondering if there's any, um, I've heard that anecdotally, but I'm, I'm not sure if Mr. Wong, do you have any, is there any way of addressing that question in the report? Uh, what's been found in other jurisdictions in terms of impacts on retention of older housing stock uh, and the impact of secondary suites? Uh, thank you, Worship, uh, for that uh, question. We, we, we do note that, uh, as you just mentioned anecdotally, um, it is difficult to get you know, hard data uh, with respect to, you know, what a suite, you know, what having a suite, you know, preserved an existing house from demolition. Uh, it's not exactly that, you know, you can't really make that direct link, but, but certainly where, where we've identified anecdotally from other communities, um, you know, we will identify that in, in, in the report. We've also heard from other, you know, in, in the community consultation, uh, we've heard from community members. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to keep my house. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and put a suite in there, as you said, for a mortgage helper. And, and I think the changes to the BC Building Code uh, help uh, to, um, you know, to, to make it a little bit easier uh, to add the secondary suite without, uh, you know, putting a, a homeowner in a difficult situation. <laughs> I was going to say between a rock and a hard place or between a, a bedrock and a foundation. Um, and so I think that certainly has helped a little bit. But yeah, as you, as you mentioned, Your Worship, it is probably more anecdotal than direct data. No, that's great. I think it's just flagging it as a, as I think, something to consider in our deliberations. It's all really that. I'm just curious. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that's included in the report, even if it's just uh, just flagging it as a potential. Um, Ms. Williams, I'm assuming there's somebody uh, who's called in. Uh, yes, Your Worship, we'll have two callers. We're just waiting for the first one to come through right now. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello and uh, welcome. Uh, our process here is you have a you can address council and on this topic and if you just state your name and your municipality of residence and then uh, feel free to speak you can make a comment or ask a question. Thank you. Um, Honourable Mayor and council members my name is Tricia Sanders and I have been um, a resident of Oak Bay for over 33 years. I wanted to just call in and say I support a bylaw to regulate secondary suites in Oak Bay. And I would like to draw attention to the strategic priorities mentioned in this report that have to do with ensuring access to device, diverse housing and demonstrating leadership to fostering community health. Regulating secondary suites is a very concrete way to demonstrate leadership and fostering community health because it is well known that creating and maintaining housing options is a key social determinant for health in both individuals and communities. I want to applaud this council for taking the time and commitment to develop a housing framework. I, like many other residents, though, have been expecting a bylaw to regulate secondary suites. 
And um, there have been many delays, as pointed out by Kara Mane and, uh, and other councillors. Um, I am asking the mayor to consider, with every other CRD community having a bylaw in place currently for regulation of secondary suites, wouldn't it be helpful as a leadership initiative during the pandemic to foster community health and increase housing options to support the development of a secondary suite bylaw sooner than later? As Mr. Anderson suggested, this is a choice that our council can make. And I'm also asking the council to consider making the letters that have been submitted by citizens on this issue available to the public. Thank you again for all the work you do on our behalf. Thank you, Ms. Saunders, and thank you for calling in. And just uh, we do, when we do consider these things for, for consideration, when we're actually getting to that stage um, of consideration of bylaws, et cetera, there is a, a call and we do uh, also make those any correspondence for those agenda items uh, available on uh, as part of our agenda package. Uh, Ms. Williams? Okay. We have the next caller. Hello, are you on the phone? No. If anybody else wishes to call in, you can call in at 59 250-598-3311. Oh, and, and welcome. Uh, if you could just, for the record, state your name and municipality of residence. Hello. Hello. Could you turn off the volume on your uh, computer at the same time? Yeah, okay. Is that better? Oh, are you talking to me? Yes, I am. Uh, if you could just turn to... <laughs> we can hear the live stream in the background, so it's a little distracting on the... Because there's a time delay, but... Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, name and municipality of residence, and you're welcome to ask a question or, or make a comment to council. Yeah, so it's Andrea Careless, Andrea, A-N-D-R-E-A, Careless, C-A-R-E-L-E-S-S. -S. Welcome, Ms. Careless. And thank you, and my um, uh, address is 2439 Heron Street. Welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. Is council listening? We are. We're all here uh, listening to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, so I'm Andrea. You, I've talked with you before. I'm with the Oak Bay Climate Force, which is a core group of eight very active members, along with a Facebook membership of 249 people. Um, my personal background is I worked in the air quality and climate change branch of the BC Ministry of Environment for about 25 years. So I do know about writing strategy, reports and consultation, et cetera, et cetera. Just, I, I feel your pain. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't have COVID, but I do have a cough, which is why I'm not there in person. Anyway, um, I guess that you could say that my concern relates to the scope of this project, um, specifically the topic areas, the policy considerations, and the trade-off questions addressed so far in the secondary suite studies and in the upcoming consultation and strategy report. As far as I can tell, they don't include climate change. So what's so important about this is I'm concerned that Council's final decision on secondary suites won't take into consideration the key priority of addressing climate change, which includes both mitigation and adaptation. And Hazel, um, I think it was you who talked about um, sea level rise, so thank you, um, noted. Also, I'm concerned that public engagement and messaging on secondary suites may not include climate change issues, which the public really needs to understand when they're forming their opinions on whether or not to go ahead with um, legalizing secondary suites. So Oak Bay is committed to looking at every initiative through a climate change lens. Secondary suites are a greenhouse gas reduction strategy that can help increase density and prevent more urban sprawl without changing the unique character of Oak Bay. Um, in the executive summary of the secondary suite study update, it says that, quote, information obtained from community engagement and the analysis undertaken at the commencement of the study has been used to further frame the discussion for considering secondary suites, unquote. So I took part in that community engagement initiative, that, which was very well done. Uh, we all wrote our concerns on sticky notes, and I noticed that, like mine, others included climate change. So I'm wondering, did climate change factor into the following discussions and studies? 
I'd like to see that consultation report, and I suggest it would have been helpful for it to be released before this report that we're considering tonight. Um, I commend you for being the council that declared a climate emergency and committed to looking at every key, key initiative through a climate lens. You also passed the recommendations of the Community Climate Action Working Group, which included a commitment to compact communities. So all good. Um, in closing, I just wanted to say that climate change will affect Oak Bay more than any other issue. It's so important that climate change be a priority when considering where we're going with secondary suites. I urge you to include climate change as an absolutely crucial part of the upcoming public consultation, the strategy report, and council's final decision. And as the previous caller said, this is about leadership. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karolisk, and have a good evening. Is there any other are there any other callers, Ms. Williams? No more callers. Right? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wong. Uh, as you're still on the line here, is there? Uh, I'm assuming that the, the the correlation of previous feedback is included in the report coming to us. Uh, is, is there anything specific there to climate change in the report? Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I'm just actually looking through some of the comments. Um, Maybe in the general comments, I think, I mean, as the caller mentioned, um, secondary suites can be part of an overall uh, densification strategy, uh, as the caller mentioned, which can create additional units without actually creating additional ecological footprint. So from that context, I think uh, the secondary suite policy and strategy uh, is framed. Uh, and I'm just looking for some specific comments with respect to climate change. There's probably one or two in here. Uh, but, you know, not necessarily one that, um, you know, that, that um, you know, I, I guess created a bar graph is what I was actually specifically looking for. But uh, within the next, uh, you know, I, I wrote that down specifically with respect to, you know, what could a climate change lens question look like, you know, in the January consultation. And uh, it's something that um, we can work with staff to frame up. Uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate that. I think the other probably the, the broader question of this is going to come into the housing framework because that's in many ways where we're going to be deciding, you know, prioritization and, and, and where and what types of housing options and that'll, that'll, that differentiation will probably matter as much as, as the specifics of this one item. Um, thank you very much for that. Are there any other, uh, we've gone around twice now to the people, uh, I think to everybody except for Councillor Appleton, is there any other comments or questions uh, to our consultants on this item? I'm not seeing any. So with that, we get a motion to receive. Uh, move Moves receipt in. for information. And seconded by Councillor Green. Thank you very much. Is there uh, any other discussion? And Councillor Appleton, just because you're remote, I'll just reach out. If, if you had anything else, I'll, I'll give you the secondary chance. I appreciate that, Your Worship. No, we can just move. Let's get moving. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's not seeing any other discussion. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and Councillor Appleton? In favor. Okay, so we have uh, all in favor except for Councillor Zelka opposed. Thank you. Capture that for the record. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wong, for your, uh, for your sitting here and answering all the questions. And look forward to seeing that report uh, coming in December. Uh, up number next on the agenda, uh, number five, Council Procedure Bylaw. And um, uh, just a reminder that this has been was swapped from the earlier uh, order that uh, had the um, the committees and commissions review first. So the, uh, the thought was to consider the, the procedures bylaw uh, first, and that will help uh, us with the secondary part as well. So um, I'm not sure who is speaking to this particular item. Is Ms. Varela? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so there's three recommendations before Committee of the Whole tonight related to the procedure bylaw. Uh, staff are requesting direction if council wishes to change the day and or time of the regular council meeting. Consider whether it wishes to recommend that council restrict the length, length of the council meeting to two hours. And then we're hoping to see the procedure bylaw uh, referred for consideration of first and three uh, readings on the, what was the date on that, Selena? November 23rd. So draft three of the document, this uh, recommends months of, uh, represents months of work and numerous presentations to council. Uh, as per your direction at the last presentation, uh, you also get to see the operation, uh, operational guidelines that serve as companion documents to these. 
while these are operational pieces, I think it demonstrates um, the commitment to standardization and consistency ac across the district that we want to achieve. So for example, um, if there were guidelines such as minute taking, we'd like to see minutes uh, taken the same way across the district. Uh, again, guidelines are, are operational and we can adjust these as necessary. Uh, where possible, we have uh, linked these to best practices or, um, for example, we used Ellie Mina as a reference for development of the minutes guidelines, who's a guru in the field. Uh, we look to um, corporate services as best practices. So uh, we made linkages where we could, uh, and we hope these are useful to both council and the public. Again, much easier to change than a bylaw, which is the benefit of putting them in a guideline. Uh, we can adjust more on the fly and again, ensure consistency across the district. Uh, with regards to the time and date of meetings, um, page four of the report details some of the rationale on why the issue was raised. But I think it's important to point out that this list is not exhaustive. And we recognize it to be a really complex issue um, that has multiple stakeholders. For example, the public will be interested in when you have your meetings. Uh, future and present elected officials will uh, have an invested uh, opinion, advisory bodies, staff. And each of these stakeholders can have very different experiences and lenses around a meeting, both leading up to during the meeting and after the meeting. So uh, currently the bylaw reflects the status quo, which is Monday at seven o'clock. Council can provide direction on whether they'd like to change um, any of those pieces or if they'd like it to remain status quo. Status quo. Um, I would like to remind Council, um, and I, I can't remember which presentation I put this forward to you at, but um, it's interesting to see that Oak Bay in our over the thumb analysis has significantly more meetings than its community comparators. Um, and I just thought it'd be interesting for perhaps uh, you and the public to be reminded of that. So Oak Bay ha in 2019 had a total of 69 meetings. Comparator communities, again, over the thumb, it could be a few meetings either way. Uh, for example, Campbell River had 45, uh, North Cowichan had 46, Central Saanich had 50. Uh, so you're seeing a lot more meetings in Oak Bay and that reflects the value that council places on their on those meetings. There's a lot of resources that go into that. And so we hope the uh, work that's gone into the procedure bylaw, again, will add clarity, uh, consistency across the organization, uh, and uh, we look forward to further direction on, on how council wants to advance this project. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rella. And just for, for my clarification up front, the appendices where that contain the guidelines are those approved as part of the bylaw approval process? They're approved just, or are they just there for our information? They're there for your information, your wor worship. Those are operational. And again, those are linked to uh, best practices in local government. Um, so those are actually approved by the chief administrative officer. And again, those can be amended as necessary. So for example, if uh, council decided there was a gap or, or an addition that you'd like to see, uh, we can have that discussion, but you don't have to go through a formal bylaw amendment procedure like you do with the procedure bylaw. And I, I think it's also useful to know that even with amending the procedure bylaw, uh, I think Selena and I were talking earlier that it could be uh, done as quickly as six weeks. Between four and six weeks when you talk about notification and things like that that's required. Uh, we recognize, again, this, this represents a shift in how the district uh, does its business. And uh, again, we hope that leads to increased uh, transparency, accountability, and ease of understanding. Thank you. And I do note that we've gone through the procedures bylaw a couple of times now uh, with appreciate the changes that have been brought forward based on that feedback. Um, so I will put it to uh, the committee. If there's any discussion or comments or questions, go ahead, Councillor Green. Thank you very much, and thank you through you, Mayor, to Ms. Riella for including, you know, our feedback um, in each draft. It's been really helpful. I just have very few comments, three, in fact. Um, and the first one is on page 10 at the bottom, 18.3. And that's the paragraph that refers to a delegation. And um, I just wondered, at the very end of that paragraph, 
Would it be possible to include the wording and copied to all council members at the very end of that paragraph? 18.3. 18.3. Um, so the corporate officer shall refuse to place a delegation on the Committee of the Whole Agenda if the matter is outside the jurisdiction of Council or if the delegation has already addressed Council sitting as Committee of the Whole on the same topic in the past six months. So all of that's fine, but I, at the very end, outcome of the appeal consideration will be provided by the Chief Administrative Officer to the de delegation. And I wanted to add and copy to all Council members so that we're aware of the outcome as, as well. Just for information. Is that possible? I don't see an issue with that, Your Worship. Thank you. And then uh, on page 12, 21.2, excuse me, um, it says, for certainty a person or organi organization must not speak to council sitting as committee of the whole on any matter that involves an application project or other initi initiative that will be or has been dealt with through another process under the bylaw or another district bylaw. Can you just provide for clarity an example of what another process would look like? Thank you. Ms. Varela? Uh, Your Worship, so for example, land use, uh, that would be dealt with at council. Uh, would not be discussed at Committee of the Whole. So again, really differentiating between a public hearing and a Committee of the Whole. Again, if there was an active file, perhaps for bylaw enforcement, uh, if there was a legal proceeding, uh, it could be quite varied. Yeah, something to do with a business license. Uh, there could be quite a wide variety of those. But again, if there's an active file or an application, um, it either wouldn't be able to be discussed or it would be referred to Council. So just for, for, the, uh, for clarity for the public, um, maybe just EG and, and maybe provide that example, that would be helpful. You know, such as active file or, you know, just an example. We can't do that as part of the bylaw, I don't think, but we could do it as part of the, as part of the covering memo attached to the next when it comes before oh, council okay. for reading. Okay, and then my last. Ms. Re oh, Ms. Rella. Oh. Uh, uh, we can consult on possibilities on how best to, to manage. I think we understand the intention. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and my last point on page 26, and this also ties back to the Commissions and Committees report, but um, under 49.0 commissions, and specifically 49.2, at least one council member will be appointed as a council liaison to each commission. Now we had to talked about the non-voting status, it is explicit for the Heritage Commission, but my question is, should it be explicit or why is it not explicit for all of the commissions? Um, so that's my question, thank you. Ms. Rella. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Green, that's a really good point, and now that the Heritage Commission also has a non-voting council liaison, we can make that, um, we can build that out as non-voting. That's great, because that would be consistent with our goal for standards across you know, committees and commissions, so thank you very much. And those are my comments, thanks. Uh, sorry, just for my clarification on that, that request, the the bylaw is currently silent on the voting membership that's under the establishing bylaw of the specific bylaw where that, that specific is mentioned. Is that, this, this, I just wanna make clear that the procedures bylaw would not include that, or would it include the additional wording about the voting status of the, of the, of the members? Uh, if we took that away and wordsmithed it, Your Worship, uh, certainly the intention is the policy. I don't know why we couldn't include it in the bylaw, but I'd like the chance for corporate services to weigh in on that um, rather than right here at the meeting. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, and, and it's not a huge burning issue for me as to where it appears, but I think it should appear either in the procedure bylaw and or in, in the Committee's Commission's re uh, report. Guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just for my clarification, it's in the establishment bylaw, is it? It is in the establishing bylaw for each of the committees and commissions is that Ms. Williams? Yes, that would be laid out in the composition and, and uh, voting rules for each of the commissions in their establishing bylaws. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams, through you, Mayor. Thank you. So no changes required in this document as long as it's there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. 
Um, thank you. Um, and, and I'm looking at the staff report and looking at the two, um, the top two recommendations um, that are, are laid out there. And the first one is consider whether it wishes to recommend that council change the day and, and or time of regular council meetings. Um, in my uh, my feeling on this is that um, I don't think that any change to that should come in this term. Uh, I know that some people um, uh, would it, they might it might. Um, not allow some people to participate in the way that they um, had thought they could participate um, when they first came on in this term. So, so I would say that um, for me, I wouldn't wish to see that come until the next term uh, or to the, till the next term of council. Um, I'm actually okay with the Mondays. It, I could be okay with the Tuesdays as well, uh, but I know that there's other meetings that are scheduled on Tuesdays. So, and when I look at the bulk of other municipalities, they tend to meet on a Monday. Um, I would, however, like to consider changing the time for the next council. I think that seven o'clock is a bit late, and I think that when we consider that staff has been working all day and then having to wait until seven o'clock to come to a meeting, um, I would prefer to see that time either be six o'clock or five thirty. Uh, but I'll be interested to hear what um, uh, my fellow councillors say about that. And as far as number two goes, I don't think that. Um, Restricting the length of the council meetings to two hours is 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 good. I mean look at the time now. It's 9.05. We've been at this for two hours We're only on item number five on an agenda that still has another item to come after it and it's a relatively short agenda So I don't think that two hours um, Would would suit um, the needs of what this council has um, I think it should either be three hours or three and a half hours um, But I'll again be interested to hear what um, my fellow councillors have to say about that uh, thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. And uh, I have, uh, <laughs> I have, uh, sorry, Councillor Nay, and then Councillor Zelka. So, just uh, a question to staff, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, I the recommendations are regarding council meetings, not committee of whole. Is, is that correct? Uh, one of the changes that we we'll make is uh, it'll be council sitting as council or council sitting as committee of the whole. When when I first got here, everybody was stumbling over whether to address you as committee of the whole or council. And so we just decided you were council sitting as either council or sitting as committee of the whole. Okay, so you're referring both to committee of the whole and to council meetings when you're on those recommendations. And second to that, um, what other communities constrict this uh, council meetings to two hours? Is there any evidence of that? Like, is anybody else doing that from which we could draw some experience? Ms. Williams? Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to clarify that the intent for Council and Committee of the Whole is captured under Clause 10, and it has a three-hour sunset on a Council or a Committee of the Whole meeting. The two-hour refers to the Committee and Commission's meetings. So that's your advisory bodies. The question here is asking for council meetings, and I, my my read of that was that it was actually that it was set at three currently, and the question was just asking if we wanted to change that. So I, I actually appreciate sort of the straw poll approach we're doing here. If people feel uh, around the table that we're asking for two meeting two hours, then that's a, we'll we'll make that change. If not, we'll leave it as is. So. I actually appreciate if people are speaking, if they can address those points, that would be helpful. So the, so Mr. Ray, so the, just for clarification, without me going through the procedure by lot, it, it does read currently three hours would be the That's correct. time in the council meeting, okay. So, um, so are we just asking questions or could we make comments too, Mr. Mayor? I think, I think questions and comments are appropriate. And if I, I might just ask, just in the interest of time, if we can, if you can speak to those those the pieces that are there, just asking the question: Is there any desire to change the day and or the time? I think the time would probably have to go away and be dealt with uh, quite considerably because I think Councilor Braithwaite is correct that that would have too much of an impact on current council to be done uh, now. Um, but if the desire is and willingness to change the, time, the date to Tuesday, um, say that, and then staff would again have to go away and deal with how that would actually get implemented. Um, but that would just be just just to give direction to staff at this point uh, as why as we're at this meeting. So if you can if you have opinions on those or, or you know if, if Tuesdays don't work, that's this is the good time to, to speak up or earlier times don't so work. It, but it, it, the point of, I mean I, I would like to see the a bit for the reasons council have made the suggestions that the, the day changed to a Tuesday to give more time that that made that was compelling to me. 
and uh, to bring the time earlier. I, are, is the concern about people at the table, councillors at the table, or is it other people in the community around 5.30? Because 5.30 does seem a much more reasonable time of day to be starting a meeting. I think people are off work, they can get here, um, community can access it, they're not waiting around till all hours of the night to be heard or to bring their applications forward. So um, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, it's hard for me to imagine in terms of the hours that we could get business done within two hours, but I would really like to see that we can finish our meetings within three hours. That for sure to me uh, seems plenty of time to finish. I mean, in particular our council meetings, where as I'm understanding, those are really, we're making legislative decisions there. It's either a vote on it or not. And m many of those things are being dealt with at the committee level where there's am more ample opportunity to discuss and consider community input. So um, uh, it's got two hours seems tight, but I, I really would like to see this council stick to the three hour meeting. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Ney. I have then Councillor Zelka and Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, regarding hours, um, uh, a meeting that starts before 6 p.m. will be difficult for me to uh, attend with my um, my other responsibilities. Uh, um, however, uh, if you know, if 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 there are um, meetings that were uh, due to uh, start uh, as at five or 5:30, uh, I would always be attending remotely. There's no way I could make it physically in person until uh, until a 6 p.m. start. Um, so just, um, I, I, however, if it'll save us money, then I'll just attend remotely. That's fine with me. Um, and if it's more convenient for staff as well um, with respect to scheduling. On the day, I'm fine to shift to a Tuesday uh, or a Monday, uh, but a Tuesday seems reasonable as uh, with respect to some of the staff suggestions there with, uh, regarding their time to prepare um, some of their responses to our many questions that come up on the weekend. Um, and uh, I can't see us uh, uh, keeping our meetings to two hours. Um, um, however, I do want to point out that uh, it's, it's interesting that many of our, of our na neighboring uh, municipalities, they probably have much fewer meetings, most likely because they didn't have as much to do. They, they took care of business, whereas we, well, I shouldn't say anything about that, okay. Um, but so soon we'll be able to have fewer meetings, very soon. Um, I did want to offer a couple of suggested uh, changes um, uh, for, uh, for council and staff's consideration um, with respect to, uh, um, uh, but let me just start by saying uh, this procedures bylaw reads so much better than uh, previous drafts. So uh, whoever, is, uh, whoever took their pen to it and cleaned it up, thank you. It, it, it is, is, it's much nicer and I appreciate how much of it has been pushed into, into definitions. And, uh, and then just a very simpler, simpler language within the actual um, uh, procedures themselves. Um, so I want to first uh, talk about um, the website. The uh, Oak Bay website is referenced in section 42.2 where it's explicit, well, explicitly says that uh, agenda, uh, excuse me, minutes may be posted to the municipal website. And I understand with respect to technology, we can't guarantee anything. Uh, and, I, and I respect that uh, as a technologist, I completely understand. So you can guarantee a piece of paper can be stuck on a wall and I get that, that, that uh, 42 two uh, makes specific reference to that as well. However, um, there's no reference to where agendas will be posted on, and re regarding the website. There is a definition called public notice posting places that I would want to suggest a, a wording change which is to add into the definition of public notice posting pages, which is on page four, uh, the written page four of the, um, of the, pre of the current uh, draft procedures bylaw, to basically to add um, to the end of the process there after it talks about the north and south sides of the Oak Bay Municipal Hall, the notice boards and that sort of stuff, comma, and may be posted to the municipal website. In other words, the same wording done for the agendas, also for the, for the minutes, also done for the agendas. Um, to uh, suggest to those who replace you in the going forward that this would be something that the uh, um, council would like to see. It's just a suggested wording. Of, uh, if staff has a better wording, I, I'm fine with that, but just some indication of the website. 
So would be good. helpful. Ms. Rellis, that uh, some change to that definition. I'm wondering if we could put it in a guideline uh, for agenda publication, and if that needs to be bolstered again. Um, if we can't meet the posting requirements, we can't legally have a meeting. So, for example, if we had said public notice places uh, and identified the website as one of those and we had a technology glitch or something like that went on, we couldn't legally have a meeting. Whereas if the intention is very much like uh, the agenda publication deadlines, uh, the, the legislation gives us so many hours in advance of the meeting. We know we want it so many days. So we put it in the guidelines so that everyone knew what we were striving for. Uh, so that might be a safer approach, Your Worship. Um, I, 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 it, as long as it's mentioned somewhere, I'm happy. Um, and the use of the word may, I thought, uh, address the issue. But, uh, but if, the, if there's a concern there... I completely understand that. I'll, um, I'll so leave it for staff to go away yeah. and, and, and look, consider that as a, as a possibility. I think that would be wonderful. Thank so you. I did also want to ask one other question related to the wordings of the current, uh, a much better wording, worded uh, draft bylaw, having to do with presentations and delegations. Uh, uh, page 3 of the uh, definitions of the current draft bylaw, uh, delegations is specifically indicating that uh, a delegation can only come to a committee of the whole and can never apparently appear at a council meeting. Um, I presume if a present delegation, because we have had um, unlit torches and pitchforks appear at our doorstep uh, in the past, I guess you could call that a delegation, rather unannounced, and yet they were accommodated. I presume for those sorts of things, we would, I, I presume, suspend the, the rules? What would we do for something like that? Or do we need to make reference to that in here? I'm not sure I remember the pitchforks in, in <laughs> torches. Um, Ms. Arilla, I, I mean, our procedures bylaw here is to allow for public to address council, uh, continuing as committee of the whole primarily. Uh, are there, are there overriding options at any time from council in terms of uh, emergency changes to, to our, our process on these? Uh, council can suspend its rules, Your Worship, but the idea is that we really wanted to firm up the idea that delegations petition to address council, presentations are requested by council or staff or another uh, agency, so they, they fill very different roles. I'm no, I don't know if that helps to clarify that question. It, it does for me. Okay. It does for me. Thank uh, you. And I appreciate the fact that suspension of the rules is still available to us. Uh, 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 was there anything else? I think that was the main aspect of this. Is the intention that this would come to November 23rd public hearing? I just want to confirm that. It, it November 3rd council this. meeting, not, not oh, public Oh, council hearing. meeting. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, I have Councillor Green and then Patterson, then I'm just assuming Councillor Appleton would like to, if he has any comments or questions, we'll go to him. Councillor Green? Yes, thank you. And I, I was remiss in not addressing those three issues. Um, I would uh, certainly support a change in the day and time of meetings, but I would be, um, I would be concerned if the time prevented one of our Council colleagues to be attending in, uh, the meeting in person. So I'm hoping is there a big difference between 5.30 and 6 o'clock? Probably not, but I will leave that for further consideration by staff. But I think it's important that meetings be inclusive and that all of us can be together, especially now when we're not, you know, not together that often. Uh, number two, I agree I would not uh, support the two hours. Just a question through you, Mayor, to staff, please. Um, what is the pur purpose of a sunset clause for meetings? And is it common practice in other jurisdictions? Just a question. Thank you. I'll give that to Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The purpose of uh, a time limit on your meetings is to give all members of the table an opportunity to ensure that they are fully able to participate in a meaningful way in the discussion, debate, and decision making. If you get to the four-hour mark and, and you have members who are exhausted, they're not able to think things through, they don't have a mechanism to stop that meeting. So the unanimous consent to continue beyond three hours ensures everybody at the table is willing and able to continue. And it, it speaks to your earlier point about inclusiveness. 
Thank you, that's excellent. And I really appreciate the explanation. I, I was never aware of why that existed. So I would certainly support the existing three hours. And on the third one, uh, refer the council, well, that that's not contentious. <laughs> was, Item was three. The, oh, no, those, that's fine. Those are the, okay. <laughs> that's just for reference. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'll come, so I now have uh, Patterson, and then I'll go to Appleton, and then I'll go to Councilor Braithwaite. Go ahead, yeah. Councilor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. We may have fewer meetings once we get through this procedures by law. <laughs> Oh, at any rate, uh, just I'll go back right to the start. And so uh, changing day or time, I'm, I'm pretty flexible. So I'm probably, you know, I, I probably have more uh, flexibility than a lot of people around the, the table. I am fine with, with um, Monday or Tuesday or what other meetings. However, I do think it would, then we have to start looking at what other meetings we are holding because, for instance, Heritage Foundation, Heritage Commission meet on Tuesday. So it start we start going down the line, but I'm sure that's something that staff will will consider um, uh, in in planning the schedule. Time, um, I I agree with Councillor Braithwaite. I think to change it now is is difficult. I would also be very interested in hearing not just work, what works for council and for staff, but what works for the general public. What, what, you know, if there is a mechanism to get some feedback from the public on what works best for members of the public, it would be useful information to have, and we have some time before any decisions or are made um, on that. So hopefully that clarifies my <laughs> sort of non-standing on it. I'm. I'm flexible. I'll, I will take direction from what others on council um, uh, would like to do. Just a couple of things on the procedural bylaw itself. I think perhaps after you've read this a number of times, you get you're starting to read into it what you would like to read into it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, page eight of thirty three on the screen, page five. I think it is of the document section 8.3 I think there's something <laughs> I think there's something missing but staff can take a look at that because it says no decisions may be made at committee of the whole meetings other than and there's nothing so <laughs> I'm good catch on the typo thank you well I'm not sure if there is important information that I don't have or if it was supposed to be changed but um, it, Ms. Williams do you want to yeah section 8.3 was uh, cut and pasted over into section 34 where it was more appropriate. Oh. Section 8 is to do with the time and location of meetings and, sec and section 34 dealt with how you could put forward motions and what impact you could have. So it got moved over and unfortunately there was this one residual line that um, is in both places but it, it will be removed from your final version. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification because I, you know, I'm like, oh my goodness, am I reading this properly? I think uh, the idea that we can just read anything we want into that blank line, <laughs> uh, a, and it makes it simple for us in the future. Yeah, uh, and uh, I guess on, um, it really comes down to public access to the meetings because um, on, on the uh, page seven, uh, page nine of 33, we talk about uh, public access to the meetings and the committee of the whole meetings and hearings, public hearings that goes on to page seven of the document. And then on page 12 of 33 and page 10 of the document, we talk about 10 days notice period for delegations. So we can, in fact, call meetings on one day's notice or whatever the timeline is to post it, but the public must give us 10 days notice if they want to speak. And I think that might be somewhat confusing to members of the public who are, who are reading this because that they, they may read into it that there won't be an opportunity then if they wish to address us as a delegation on a subject. Uh, sure, um, Ms. Rella? Uh, the 10 days is linked to the uh, agenda publication deadline. So, for example, uh, staff reports have to be provided to corporate services 10 days in advance, which is when we start to build the agenda. 
Uh, if something came up, we could also uh, consider a special meeting if there was a, a time sensitive or urgent nature. I'm getting a, so a how will members of the public then un understand this? If something comes up quickly and they re were to read this, and they think, well, I'm shut out because it's come on sh such short notice, I can't possibly give 10 days notice. What's the workaround to that? So the public, the public can address us on issues that come to council. This is for specifically for delegations and presentations. So I, I think, and we have a regularly scheduled gen, um, meeting schedule that that would be attached to. Um, so I'm not sure, you're just talking about, should council call a special council meeting or committee of the whole meeting? That would, and, and maybe that the broader question here is, does the same uh, agenda standard apply if we're having a special meeting as opposed to a regularly scheduled meeting? Because these really apply to our regularly scheduled meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, Your Worship, so um, the way public participation works at Committee of the Whole is a delegation which involves an application and an extended timeline. There's also opportunity, and I bet you Celine is flipping to that page about the other public uh, opportunities, but there is uh, a more free flow where, where people have, I think it's three minutes still, Selena, if you can get there. Uh, but the delegation is actually an application form for an extended period of time. So we actually built the public participation with more opportunity than currently exists for the public. Does that make sense? Currently, there isn't an opportunity to make application for an, for an extended um, appearance before council. You have three minutes. Ms. Williams? I'm just going to build on what uh, CAO Varela has shared. So I think, uh, I think Councillor Patterson, what you're, what you're thinking about is a special meeting of council which has a very different order of business on the agenda and does not reflect delegations, presentations, etc. A special meeting of council is called for a specific purpose and according to the legislation that's the only business that should be dealt with on that agenda whereas the delegations and presentations are at regular meetings, and those are the ones that we will give notice of once a year, so the public is fully aware of when those meetings happen. I hope that helps. Thank you. I, I think that does clarify it. I'm not sure that perhaps if members of the public read this, that, but that's very helpful, having that clarification, and they, you know, it may not be quite as consistent. Now on some of the appendixes that are attached to this, and thank you for clarifying that they were really for staff use, I, I do have a couple of questions if I may though about them. Go ahead. Um, let me see. Appendix, on Appendix B, the Public Correspondence um, Guidelines, in number two it says it will be actioned as soon as possible. I thought that was a little ambiguous for a policy document, but um, perhaps staff can. Uh, I'll give that to staff in terms of the. Uh, currently, we have a, a practice where correspondence comes in. It's automatically forwarded to the director uh, who's responsible for that department, as well as mayor and council, if that's appropriate. Right now, we do we work on an as soon as possible basis because there's so many requests and they're so varied. Sometimes it's just a simple phone conversation. Sometimes it takes research. Uh, sometimes it affects multiple departments, so it's difficult to apply a single standard across uh, a wide array of possible public inquiries or correspondence pieces. Okay. It, if, it, if we could, it might be helpful to be able to say something about our goal is to process whatever it is within a certain period of time. Perhaps uh, there's, yeah, I, I, I can certainly see the that being a part of number one in terms of the acknowledgement timelines so that things aren't left without an acknowledgement within a certain amount of time. I think the actioning question is probably a bit more difficult to, to undertake, but something to consider is that, you know, setting a standard for response, at least in terms of acknowledgement uh, as part of that process. Uh, and again, yeah. 
Go ahead, um, Councilor Patterson. And the other, the other item I'm, I'm just wondering about is uh, how correspondence is handled if it is sent uh, marked confidential. So it could be coming to staff members, it could be coming to members of council. That is not specifically um, addressed in the in the policy. I'm not sure that it it needs to be, but it is, uh, uh, you know, something that I think the public, if they do send a member. Uh, a letter and it's marked confidential that they would like that reassurance that it is confidential. Um, I don't believe it's countered. It's not countered in our current correspondence. Can we just leave that with staff to consider the, the addition of, of specific specifications around confidential? I think that would be, you know, I think give comfort to everybody both sending and receiving as to what that what that policy is. That's all for me. Mayor. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Patterson. I uh, appreciate the comments on that. Uh, I have now Councillor uh, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, just with respect to the, the recommendations and, and what's in, in front of us as a committee to discuss, uh, just with respect to changing the day of council meetings, I, I mean, I'm ambivalent on this point. I, I don't really have a preference one way or the other. I don't think it necessarily materially alters the ability of the public to engage, but I, I recognize that there may be some benefits to a, a choose to a date change to Tuesday to uh, facilitate uh, more uh, time for staff and potentially a, a, a more fulsome experience for members of the public. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be willing to consider that. Um, I, I do, however, take a fairly uh, different view of a potential time change. Um, I, I am not of the view that an earlier meeting facilitates uh, engagement for the public. Uh, and so there, there are obstacles uh, for, for myself, certainly, but I actually more, more focused on what obstacles are presented for the, the public to engage in. And I, I submit that in a situation where you have somebody who has a relatively uh, inflexible work schedule, uh, has family obligations, has, diff uh, you know, has to commute and move back and forth, uh, that a uh, an earlier the earlier the meeting goes, uh, the more difficult it makes it for people to engage in that uh, for members of the public to engage in, in attending that meeting, and of course nobody does want to have their item on the agenda come up at 10 o'clock at night, and I and I recognize that, but um, I I'm, I'm fairly adamant that the seven o'clock start time, which is as, as we've noted, uh, pretty almost universal and pretty common across the, the region, I, I, I believe has been arrived upon to, to strike the best balance between what uh, is, is not excessively late in the evening, but also affords people the ability to uh, uh, deal with their work and family obligations before they attend. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very uh, committed to the idea that uh, that seven o'clock start times is, uh, is is more engaging of the public, and, and that is my primary concern. Um, with respect to the length of council meetings, uh, I'm, I'm happy with the three-hour limit that's laid out in the in draft procedure bylaw as it is. I think that that is a good functional number. I thank you, Councillor. Is there anything else you wish to talk to on the broader uh, structure of the procedures bylaw? I. Uh, collectively a, a, a fulsome discussion around the procedures bylaw. Uh, as others have mentioned, it represents a, a significant improvement over previous, and, and I know that it's been said before, but it bears repeating that we recognize um, the enormous amount of heavy lifting that uh, amending this bylaw has taken for staff, so I just wanted to take that uh, opportunity to mention that again. Happy to uh, support it moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll just... Before I get to Councillor Braithwaite, I haven't given my input. Uh, I personally don't like Tuesdays for, for my own personal uh, self-interest because I often have CRD meetings that go for a long time on Wednesdays, and the, the notion it's exhausting to my mind of staying up late on a Tuesday. However, uh, I also know that I am one of a whole team, and I'm totally able to manage that. So if the will is to move it to Tuesdays, I'm quite fine with that. And, but I do recognize it has a cascading impact on police board, which is also Tuesday nights, and a bunch of other things. So it's not as simple as just saying yes. But I feel from the conversation tonight that there's a general willingness to look at that and to, and to see how that would work. So I think it's definitely worth bringing back as a, 
as a as a piece and maybe a timeline attached to how that would roll out. Um, I I heard f from people. I think if we given we don't have unanimous on a time change, I think that would be something that would have to be considered at the for perhaps the next council if we wanted to look at that as a uh, piece. But again, if that change was to happen, I would suggest that would have to happen by the end of next year because I think anybody you know who would be considering running for council would want to know uh, the anticipated expectations of time that and date that they would want to run for. Uh, and the two hours I'm fine with. I think that's it's. I'd love it, but I think it realistically, I think we have to re be realistic that three hours is the reality of our of our meetings uh, on some occasions. So um, that's my feedback on it. Um, I just really also want to just say how much I appreciate the appendices. Uh, I read through them and just smiled about, okay, fine, you know, this is so nice to see codified uh, so many of these sort of questions that I think really materially impact the way that the the day-to-day the -day operations work and, and frankly how that information will come to council and, and so uh, and I really appreciated the details on the on the minutes uh, in particular just that that codifying of kept capturing the, the points of discussion uh, but not getting in making it personal and, and, and keeping it at a very high level so I thought that was a significant uh, improvement and, and, and really meets the, the goals of, of the organization and, and in the interest of the archives who have to record this, having some capture of that I think is really valuable. Um, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, actually, you've kind of touched on what I was going to um, speak to, which was I know that there will be a cascading effect um, as the UN, both, count, both UN Councillor Patterson have spoken to um, in changing the dates to Tuesday. And, and CRD is a, a big one, I think, um, for, to, to take into consideration for you. And yes, you are just one player around the table. However, um, it's an important role that you play at the CRD table, and so I think that we really should take that into, into account. Um, I, I think for now, um, we should leave things as they are. Um, I do appreciate, and as I said before, that for some council members, um, changing time um, in this particular term uh, would not be, um, would not sit well for their schedules and so I think that that's important that we take that into consideration as well. So for now I think that um, what I hear people saying is that maybe we should leave things as they are and look to making any changes for the end of next year um, for the next incoming council to uh, so that they have a good idea of what their expectations would be. Just for my clarification, if if the because I, I heard a slightly different message from definitely a difference between the time and the and the day, because um, I heard a general okay with the Tuesday, and if it has significant benefit, then we should probably consider that. But what would be the mechanism? Like we have recommendations for procedures by law here with dates and times. So how would that even work if we didn't want to do it on January first, but consider it later in the year or the following year in terms of the actual bylaw process? Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, there's two ways that, that council could affect that, and, and the one is, of course, we proceed with the bylaw as it is, Monday at 7 o'clock, um, and continue on, and at some point during 2021, we would bring back the bylaw for an amendment to change the date and the time and or one or the other. The second alternative is under, I believe it's Clause 6, which speaks to the date and time for council meetings. At the end of the clause that states that council meets on Mondays on the second and fourth at seven o'clock, uh, we put un up until July thirty first, twenty twenty one, or some date, whichever date council thought thought was um, was workable, and then we would add another clause that would then entrench the time, date, and place for meetings beyond that point, hmm. and the first clause would be superseded. Okay, thank you for that. So that's. That's that. Thank you. That helps clarify for me. I think the if if we want to give that direction, that makes sense to do it in a in a tangible way. That again, I'm just I'm thinking of people who would be applying for committees and commissions, uh, and in the coming year is just to make sure that they understood that that those changes would probably be happening midway through the year, and that consultation could consider those changes in the in the in the in the downstream. And I'm also thinking, of course, of the police board, which would have to suddenly you know make sure that that's incorporated in their in their in their meeting schedule as well so um okay i have uh councillor uh, council was there anything else Councillor zelka uh thank you i've just got one more uh suggested uh change for the uh, bylaw um 
uh, of the procedures bylaw, which is uh, the one reference on page two of the report, uh, which suggests adding the definition of public engagement. I think that's quite a reasonable thing to do. Um, I, I do note that you say it's only referenced twice in the draft bylaw. However, I do notice, for example, on agenda item one and two of today's meeting, we have an undefined reference to IAP2 that's used in the standard staff report template used mm -hmm. for both of those agenda items. So as a result of uh, IAP2 being used in general in every staff report, it seems reasonable that we should define it somewhere. Um, so uh, that's why I would suggest it be added uh, in here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zolka. Um, we haven't had the discussion on that yet, but I, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take direction of council on that on that point. Um, so, uh, just to wrap this up here and to give some direction for coming back with uh, with the bylaw next week, um, where I'm seeing this is no change to time. I'm not entirely clear on whether or not uh, a future change to Tuesdays is 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 seen by the majority of council as a um, uh, uh, desire. Um, I think we're very clear that we're going to keep it at the, th the, the current three hours. And then that would come back to November 16th with those changes. So I think I'm just going to reach out, sort of very quickly go around the table one by one. I'm just going to ask our people, do people want to see a change to Tuesday's middle of next year or at the end of next year or not until the next council term? So I'm going to ask that question. I'm just going around the table and we can have a motion to kind of clarify that if that's okay. And I'm going to pick on Councillor Nay first <laughs> on that. Uh, Tuesday's uh, not till next council term. I think I think not until next next council Just, term. Yeah. yeah, well, you can give an explanation if you want. But well, I, I think sooner rather than later. And I'm really thinking of staff. I, I look at staff trying to make a real effort to keep people on board here and and not overwork them. And and um, the the way the report is written, I'm understanding this is a a, a really um, uh, what well, we were talking about the day. Sorry. So. Um, I, I think this does give staff more time. I think it gives the public more time. Uh, it, um, I'm surprised more uh, municipalities don't do it. So I would say Tuesday, and I would do it earlier rather than later. Okay. I count the breathway. I'm really torn on this one. Um, I can see the, um, the benefit of moving to Tuesday for staff specifically, um, but I think that it really does have a cascading effect. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if we can work it out, then sure, let's move till Tuesday. Um, I'm okay going to it um, at the end of next year um, because I think that we need to put that much time in motion um, for us to be able to um, to change all the other meetings. I mean, if it can be done faster, then fine. But, yeah, I'm very wishy-washy on this, <laughs> uh, honestly. I mean, I, I'm happy to leave it at Monday at 7, but I'm also happy to change it to Tuesday at 7 as well. Okay. Councillor Green? Um, I'm certainly open to trying Tuesdays. I think uh, we've had meetings on Tuesdays when there were stat holidays, so it would resolve the issue of stat holidays. We wouldn't be having meetings on stat holidays. That's one, one thing. Um, so I'm, I'm open to Tuesdays. I, I respect everyone's comments around the table, but I, I'm thinking we could, uh, I think Ms. Williams had a good idea. Uh, we could do it up to a certain date and then int introduce it next sep September of next year. We have a break over the summer. We, we don't have meetings in August, I believe. So if people were open to that, we could introduce it in September and then bring it back, you know, in three to four months to assess because I'm as concerned as Councillor Zalka is about, or Councillor Patterson, about how it works for the public as well. So by then, hopefully, we can get some feedback from the public on the change. Um, and we do right now have such limited public engagement. Anything that will enhance that, um, I, would be, I would support Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. As I said, I, I am flexible, but I, I am concerned about changing the date simply because of other meetings. And so I think I would like to very, really to know 
all of the other meetings and how our change in schedule will um, will affect those because it does start a cascading bump when we um, are council liaisons to committees here in Oak Bay. We all are also participating on other committees within that have a, a regional aspect to them, um, and so it is. It is. It sounds reasonably simple, but I think it may be more complex. And so, you know, if the council meeting got bumped to Tuesday, that starts to bump the heritage meetings, and that gets into my CRD. You know, and I, I, I really honestly can't give you an opinion because I don't think any of the other groups are going to want to change their meetings at the CRD. I believe that's why most councils actually do meet on a Monday because of the scheduling for regional meetings and, and what happens with those. So we, I really need to see it mapped out, and, and then I would give an opinion. But um, until then, I, I really can't. <laughs> OK. I think those are all very valid points, though, in terms of needing to understand the cascading impacts. So Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, it, I'm, I don't want to say I'm wishy-washy. I guess you could say with, with respect to my initials, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm easy. To some extent, yes. Um, uh, I could go either way, um, but I do want it to be clear. Um, I believe last mandate uh, we changed Committee of the Holes from 6 to 7 and uh, to standardize a particular time. And uh, the public was confused for a while. Even members of council were confused for a while in terms of people showing up late, showing up early. People couldn't, because people got into a flow, right, for a number of years. So we're now into a flow on Mondays at 7. So if we change it, it will have to be well advertised. Uh, like repeatedly, um, yeah, so um, I'm easy either either way. As long as it's uh, 6 p.m. or, or beyond, uh, uh, and I don't, it doesn't matter on the day for me. Uh, I'm getting the sensation around the table that people are easy, but I also think that there's the uh, there's the sensation here that we haven't quite figured out whether or not it's what the impacts are on this. So I'm thinking for the purposes of the bylaw, we may just have to keep it as as it is and come back with another report. So uh, that's why I'm reading, but Councillor Appleton, you're, you're up last on this on this list. Uh, I will be brief then, Your Worship. Uh, I, my preference is for the status quo. Okay. So I think we need to look at that, that cascading impact a little bit more, uh, is what I'm hearing around the table here, just to make sure that we're clear. But there's no objection to the Tuesday as long as we can uh, you know, find a path to make it work. So uh, perhaps we can just leave it as, as is and, and, and have a secondary motion to bring back a report in terms of what that would, because I think it was going to have to go to each of us independently and look at our committee uh, requirements around the region as well to, to, to see what that is. Again, Councillor Ney, you had your hand up. Just a, a compromise um, suggestion around the time. I'm wondering if the council would consider a 6.30 time that Victoria has. So... We're currently at seven, and I think what I heard, uh, Councillor Appleton, I think you were the one that had the primary concerns about moving it earlier, and I don't think it's reasonable for us in the middle of a term of people making a commitment to change the time if, unless it's unanimous agreement on, on changing that time. So, uh, Councillor Appleton, I think you and Councillor Zelker are the two that have the hardest uh, uh, scheduling issues. Can we ask? Yeah, I'm just asking. Councillor Appleton, is... Any ch is any change to the time for you viable, or is it is it really? Uh... Well, I, I appreciate your asking, Your Worship. Again, you know, it, it it does present a challenge for me personally, but I really raised the issue not so much for myself, but really for future council members. What future council members may find able to do, uh, and what members of the public will find suitable. So, on on the whole, uh, you know, although there is a challenge for me personally. Um, you know, I, I really feel more strongly that it provides a disincentive. I think 7 o'clock is consistent with other regions, you know, with other municipalities across the region. Uh, I think it's the most accessible. I, 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 don't, I, I don't see that a, a change to 6.30 really represents a significant change, to be honest with you. So, I, 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 again, my, my preference is the status quo. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm getting the sensation here. We just don't have the, enough information to make that, that, that commitment without the piece. So what I think we, we from what I'm hearing here is that uh, not changing the date or time or the length of the things, that the, that the way it's listed right now, but I think secondary to this would be a report, ask for staff to bring back a report on 
on options for changing the date and time and, uh, and, and provide that information a bit more fulsomely to, to this body to consider uh, either later this year or later in 2021 or, or into the new council term. Uh, Councilor Green? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I do have one outstanding question around procedure bylaw. Do we have, through you, or your worship, do we have a social media policy that could be or would be included in a procedural bylaw? Thank you. Ms. Williams? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was shaking my head as in no, we, <laughs> we wouldn't incorporate it into the procedure bylaw. It would be a standalone policy. Yes. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite? Um, before I make a motion, um, I just realized that I actually have a commitment on a board that I, I sit on, um, on its, uh, our board meetings are on Tuesdays. So that, uh, you know, that kind of adds into my comp complications as well, because I have made a commitment to a board and to then have to make that change would be, would be hard. Um, so I would like to um, refer Council Procedure Bylaw 2020 number 4740 to Council for consideration for the first of three readings. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Councilor Braithwaite, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, um, I think that um, it, I'm wondering if we need to add another motion after this to have a report come back or if it's just an understanding. No, I'll have a motion. Okay. I don't. I think understandings are always dangerous, so let's have, a, let's have a motion to that. But for now, let's deal with the, the core of this, which is referring this. So this would, as it's listed then, essentially that uh, as, as is. Okay. And it's moved in. Did I get a seconder? Yeah, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Councillor Zelka? Uh, yes, uh, at today's meeting, a number of s potential changes or suggestions were offered to, uh, to staff. Uh, would they be potentially incorporated or, or would we then discuss that at council for changes? Uh, I'm going to go to staff on uh, Ms. Varela. Uh, those will be incorporated where feasible, Your Worship, and there'll be a covering memo again so council can see what happened to all of their directions. Thank you. Um, any other discussion on this? Not seeing any, I will then call the question. All those in favor? Uh, Councillor Appleton? In favor. Thank you. Uh, any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. So that will go to the next, or to Council for uh, for first and second reading. Um, but uh, yeah, is there a, perhaps Councillor Braithwaite, you raised the notion of, of having a second motion to, or Councillor Green on a. Uh, just to, to direct staff to come back with some options for changing dates and times. Yeah, I'll make the motion to ask staff to come back with um, some direction on changing dates and times, days and times for um, council and committee of the whole meetings. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, do you want any further direction on that or is that sufficient, uh, Ms. Varela, given the conversation we've had here today? I think it's sufficient, Your Worship, and we can bring it back and have more conversation. We'll bring it back at a committee of the whole to allow for that discussion. That's great. Thank you. And just uh, it might suggest that we, we reach out to the members of council so we can kind of take some time through our, our calendars and just double check our, our schedules just to make sure if there's, because some of our meetings, no matter who's attending them, might have to be attended by someone of council just to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, all right. Thank you for that motion. Any other discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor? Councillor Appleton. Councillor Appleton, you're on mute, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that passes uh, onto item number six on the agenda, and uh, we're running a little long in our meeting here, so we'll, um, and I appreciate the breaking out. I think I was hoping that we might actually get through the Heritage Commission details tonight, but I think we're going to uh, follow the advice of, uh, of, of the staff to break that out into a separate meeting. Um, so um, we have the, the, the report here. Ms. Rell, it's probably still worth giving a quick overview of, of how we got here and what's, in, what's included. Uh, absolutely, Your Worship. So again, this is a culmination of a, a long-standing project, lots of work by both uh, council staff and the advisory body members themselves. Um, based on the input that we've received uh, from the members, we feel we're pretty close on the Advisory Planning Commission design panel and the Advisory Planning Commission land use. Uh, and we're asking for council to consider first three readings and the draft terms of reference for those bodies as well as the draft terms of reference for the Public Advisory Committee. Uh, and that would allow us to proceed with recruitment and uh, stay on a timeline. Then what we could do, recognizing the um, issues that surround the Heritage Commission and potential changes, 
uh, demonstrated confusion between the roles and mandates of the Heritage Foundation and the Commission. So, so knowing how valuable that is and how complex that discussion is, uh, we'd like to pull that out and do a standalone workshop so Council can really identify what it needs out of uh, the Commission, that advisory body, clarify the roles of those two different groups and offer that clarity to the membership. So we're hoping that's a solution going forward. We would organize a facilitated planning session before the end of 2020. And then what we'd also do is extend the existing Heritage Commission membership because we know that would delay recruitment uh, to February 28th, 2021. And th then finally, we would look to, um, to have a recommendation for the committee and commission policy to be amended to reflect that council liaison to the Heritage Commission is appointed as a non-voting member. So again, keeps you moving forward with three of your advisory bodies, uh, breaks out a standalone workshop for that one that needs special attention, uh, and keeps us on a path. So we're hoping Council could consider that tonight. Okay, thank you. And I'm just going to remind uh, anybody watching that wishes to comment on anything, you can do that on this item as well. Uh, that number is 250-598-3311. Um, I have Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and through you, thank you very much for the report. Um, and you're right, it has been a long time and a lot, a, a lot, quite a body of work that's been completed. Just a question. Um, the one thing that I, I didn't see mentioned, and I was just wondering, I know that there was a report written on the Parks and Rec, um, Parks and Rec, the future of Parks and Rec. That report was authored by Councillors Braithwaite and Patterson. Will it be reflected in any of this material? Thank you. Ms. Rella? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So. Um, no is is the short answer not at this time we're really trying to get the ones uh that have uh establishing bylaws in terms of reference that just needed amendments that's going to be a total revamp and again uh that might be something that we have to break out as a special workshop i i see that taking a bit of of council discussion so right now we're trying to keep your existing bodies moving forward uh, there was discussion uh, about a potential finance committee. So again, new bodies we'd bring back and, and seek council direction on those, but we're really trying to get your recruitment underway for your existing bodies first. Just supplemental um, through you, to, through you, Your Worship, to Ms. Rella. Um, and the only reason I'm, I'm asking for two reasons. One is that I recall there was a lot of work done at that time and the, and the second reason I was asking, I had, I've had inquiries from the public asking about uh, Parks and Rec and about the reemergence of some kind of body to advise that, that is part of the public um, sector. So I'm, that, that was the reason for the question. And I, I know that it was an active body at one time, and I know it needed to be revisited, but I, I think and I would probably defer this to Councillor Braithwaite, but I think there is certainly a need for an advisory body in that area still because it, 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 ha it has a huge public role as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I might just put that to the question of, of timelines for that to come back, um, that and the Finance Committee discussion. Do we, have a, do we have a sense of when that would come back to Council? Uh, no, Your Worship. We're booked up between now and the end of December um, with agendas right now, so it would be in January we're anticipating. We'd like to bring that forward for uh, along the lines of strategic planning and budget and, and those pieces there uh, because there could be additional resourcing costs or things like this as, as Council decides to add additional advisory bodies. So we want to bring that back early in the new year. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Green. Would you like me to continue? Please. Thank you. Um, and yes, I, I certainly agree on page two of eight under the Heritage Commission uh, that they that that one be held back. I think that I think that is a good idea pending a planning session. Um, on page four of eight, um, under the Advisory Planning Commission, um, is there a council liaison appointed now to every every one of our commissions? Um, I, I wasn't sure if it was there, but I just wanted to make a note to myself just to ask the question. Yes, there is. Okay, great, thank you. Then moving on to page um, five, um, 
I was just wondering about the date for the planning session for the Heritage Commission, and you said before the end of December then. Okay, thank you very much. I wanted to confirm that. And my final question, and I think it's already been answered. Yes, it has, regarding non-voting status for all commissions of Heritage Liaisons. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent report. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to need a few extra minutes to get to this, but I need a, no a unanimous vote to move it past this. So I've got to wait for Councillor Zalka to get back, so I'll take another 45 seconds or so of comments or questions. Oh, is it 10.30? Yeah. Under, I think oh, it's 10.30 10, 10 under it's a car. It's 10.30 under your current See, I'm already bylaw. under the, I'm already, is it, I get, I do I'm this. I'm doing it too. Nice, terrible. 10.30 under the current bylaw. Okay, so I don't have that. But we still can aspire to our three-hour limit as we are moving towards. Uh, the Council Braithwaite, did I see your hand? No, I was just going, I was on the, I was on the Okay. Calls. Thank you. Uh, was there any, uh, any other questions or comments on this? Um, Councillor Appleton? Uh, just very briefly, Your Worship, I, I just I appreciate the uh, the approach taken here with the with the planning session for the Heritage Commission uh, very much. I think that that's an excellent excellent response. You know, I, I I I think we all recognize the importance of of streamlining and clarifying the roles of the advisory bodies. But then I also uh, you know clearly hear from the members. You know, the the feedback that the members of the commission have provided. Uh, to us, you know, through this material and, and sort of relating to their specific expertise and the passion for what they do, um, you know, I, I think we need to take that seriously. So I, I appreciate the approach taken here. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, I had one, uh, just to their hands, just in the, in the um, Advisory Planning Commission for Land Use, uh, under the desirable skill sets, we had talked about adding heritage, and I think that might be something that, uh, you know, based on the conversation we've had at this table, that that might be supported. Uh, so I just wanted to just do a quick straw poll of people here. If that's, we have a list of, of desirable expertise. Was that one? I'm seeing nodding around the table, uh, pretty much unanimously. So can we include that in the uh, in the uh, APC list of of of, of knowledge? Uh, staff will uh, make sure that happens, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, and what else was there I had? Um, I appreciate the, the pushing things to heritage. There's two other questions I said I had for this table. One was um, if there's anything specific, because we're going to be coming back to that planning session, but if there's any specific aspect of heritage uh, commission or foundation, I guess for that matter, that you would like to see addressed, maybe not have a solution, but have, see addressed, this would be a good chance to raise that so staff can actually go do some research and bring some some options for that. Um, for example, I had one, there was a number of questions raised about public consultation and, uh, and really probably more if someone has a body of expertise in a particular area of heritage, is there a mechanism by which the Heritage Commission could invite that person uh, to the meeting? So either, I don't think we can have a broader general public input but say there was a, a heritage thing on, on the Todd House might be an example. If there was a recognized air expert at, at Todd House to, to come and speak to them, is that invitation process possible? So I would just raise that as a, as a question, not, a, not to get an answer tonight. Um, but that's the only one I really had uh, in, that, in that framework. If there's anything else that people would like to make sure that we kind of question, now is a great time so that staff doesn't go, oh, well, we could look into that. But then we're, again, delayed by another few weeks or a month at Council Green. Yes, thank you. I'm reminded um, through you, Your Worship, or to you, uh, there was an inquiry uh, from the public in an email today asking about HR, HAPs and HRAs. Um, I recall that they were wanting to know why they, you know, there would be no public input into the, those applications while they were at the Heritage Commission table. Um, is that something that could be clarified? Uh, yes, Your Thank Worship. You. Uh, Director Anderson is also on the line, but I think there's pieces of land use applications and then council's decision making and the idea that uh, you're going to get multiple inputs from multiple places. So with regards to those specific applications, I'm not sure if Director Anderson could like could weigh in on that or not. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah. Um, Again, um, 
what we're asking for is the, the advisory body, the Heritage Commission to provide their recommendations to council on a, on a matter. Um, we're not asking them to uh, seek uh, advice or input from members of the public when they're weighing in on heritage alteration permits or heritage revitalization agreements. We're actually asking the advisory body for that advice. So uh, I think to be consistent with our other committees, we, we're not asking the commissions to seek uh, public input to their uh, consideration of a recommendation to council. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Councilor Green? A supplemental question then. Um, for those members of the Heritage Conservation Area, if they had specific concerns or questions around an HRA or an, or a, or an HAP from that area specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, how would they address those questions and inquiries? At what point in those processes then will the public have input? I'm assuming through a public hearing, but not necessarily. Uh, no, it wouldn't definitely be through a public hearing. Mr. Mr. Anderson, uh, is there, a, outside of writing to uh, staff or council, is there any mechanism built in currently for a heritage alteration permit process? I don't believe either there currently is, but I don't know if there's something contemplated no, in this no, process. Worship, a heritage alteration permit is, is much like a development permit in that respect. It doesn't have a public hearing or a public uh, input component. The HRA, however, the revitalization agreements do have a public hearing um, component as that is a, a bylaw that's approved by council. So that HRA opportunity for public input through the public hearing, HAP does not have um, uh, a public input component to it. Councilor Green? Yes, thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and just one point on page two under analysis, uh, the advisory design panel, it said no feedback received. That wasn't because they weren't interested. I think it's because their their body remained status quo. So there were no fundamental changes. So that was the only reason. But they 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 were certainly keen to to be involved. So I just don't, didn't want that to be misinterpreted as apathy. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, sorry, I just in listening to this, it just made me think about um, the opportunity for um, public input into the Heritage Commission. I know that uh, when Parks, Rec and Culture Commission was having their meetings, they actually had, as council does, um, a, an opportunity at the beginning of a meeting for public input, for public participation. And I'm wondering if that might be a solution that we could add or, or why does Heritage not have that as a commission? Why does Heritage not have that when Parks and Rec and Culture did? I, I hate ask putting why questions to staff. Um, I think, I mean, just for to back this up a little bit, we, the process we've taken to this point, I just, I just, I want to make sure I'm getting this right, but Ms. Varela can correct me because I'm probably getting it wrong. Um, that was an intentional part of the piece going forward was to try and bring a clarity for where public input is brought. It's brought at specific points, either at council committee of the whole or public hearing and it's done once so that people understand that. And it's to take some of the pressure away from places like heritage commissions where if you have a particularly zealous applicant that wants to bring 50 friends and, and, and tell them all how wonderful the application is, it doesn't provide, that's not the right venue for it. It should be brought to a venue that is advertised and is available to the broader public on those pieces. So that was the intention of this. I think that if that's not the will, then we should revamp that, that question because currently, under land use, we wanted the, the decision was made a long time ago in guiding these pieces to keep the, the public input in the public input processes and, and use the expertise of those bodies to give us advice, but separate from the public input. I think, is that fair, uh, Ms. Varela? Yeah, so if we think back to that diagram that we've used and we've now uploaded to the website, it's that council's decision making is based on multiple inputs of which advisory bodies are one, the public is one, staff reports are one, policies, regulations, legislation are other pieces. So again, it's not the idea about building consensus. Uh, it, it's about giving depth to council's decision making. So um, again, if, if you're grouping together an advisory body based on the lens they bring to the table, is that the place to put the public who may be conflicted in their, their 
position? Is is that the role of the advisory body is to weigh out, um, you know, the pro or con based on public input? Um, our our position going forward is that really is a governance level is for you to listen to your public. Uh, your advisory bodies are appointed, you're elected. And so that's a real foundational piece. So if council doesn't agree with that, we need to hammer that out uh, early. We need to talk about why you have advisory bodies, what you need out of them, uh, things like that. So that's what we're hoping to workshop to get that kind of clarity for you. And again, staff serve at the, sorry, it's getting really late, serve at the pleasure of council. So, um, you know, we can, we can workshop that out, but if anything you could give us for um, things you're thinking about like that, that you have concerns about, please uh, provide those to staff in, is it in advance as we're detailing out the workshop and what that's going to look like. And then we will bring those pieces forward for uh, discussion in open meetings so that the public and membership is also brought along. But I think we have to, to um, in that workshop, build a bit of a common knowledge base, saying do we all agree that we're here and then what are we trying to um, fill in? What, what is it that council needs to augment its decision making? Thanks, uh, Councilor Patterson. Oh, the mic is cut out. Uh, can we make sure? Ms. Rella, can you just turn off your microphone? All right. There, I thought I was just cut off. <laughs> no. uh, thank you, Mayor. I think what I'm hearing um, in the discussion about uh, heritage, and, and it is a broader one because we have both the Heritage Commission and the Heritage Foundation. And the commission has uh, an extensive role within the community. Certainly there, I there are the, the things like the land applications that uh, Ms. Varela uh, spoke to, and, and I agree with the comments that she made about that. But the, the subject of heritage, certainly at the provincial level, as, as they have stated, heritage is what is important to the community. And so for the Heritage Commission to continue to evolve, as other municipality heritage commissions do, they have to keep getting, testing the pulse of the community to understand what the, what heritage really means as a reference to the community as it changes over time also. And so it is particularly those types of of pieces of information that having public input on at the meetings would be really valuable to the Heritage Commission because it, it, it will not work if it's up to council to tell the Heritage Commission um, what they what they should go be going out and doing. Certainly with the land application component of it, totally understandable and and there's there are regulatory frameworks around that that it's very important that we be mindful of and we adhere to legislation but there's the broader aspect of that an example is the designation of uplands the by the federal government as a uh, national um, heritage site we haven't even had those discussions yet at the Heritage Commission about what does that mean? How do we put that into context? How do we bring that into um, a framework of what we may be bringing recommendations to council on? Um, and so I think as a council, we would want to have that valuable input from the table on those things. We don't want to um, in any way create bar barriers to those very positive discussions that we need to have. So it's, it's really two separate issues. And I think these are some of the things that as we get into the discussion with the Heritage Commission, the, the, the piece that we're going to by a breakout session, those are the things that we're, we will be bringing to the table and hopefully be able to develop a framework around those issues and the public input on those issues. Thank you, Councilor Patterson. Ms. Varela, did you have yeah, anything to add? Yeah, Your Worship. So I think that's part of what I'd like to tease out a bit. Um, and emails or phone conversations are welcome, at, again, as we're developing that workshop. Um, but I think the idea is there, the status quo is confusing. 
So you can see that by the correspondence that you've received. And so the idea, if council wants to create flexibility or innovation or whatever that is within the mandate of any advisory body, then you can do that by saying we would like to, for example, build in uh, annually a visioning process whereby body X uh, gives recommendation to council that feeds into the strategic planning and budget process. So one of the things, again, if, if you don't put any framework or you don't commit to resource an idea or innovation, you'll actually have advisory bodies that have the best intention and the best ideas, um, but it's frustrating if they don't get resource or built into a work plan. And so we, what we need to do is find out how much innovation or visioning or whatever that word is um, for your advisory body and then how do we feed that into the process so that council can actually commit to resource it whether it's with budget capacity uh, a speaker once a year whatever that is but if we just leave it wide open it, it creates confusion and expectations aren't being met and I think that's again what's clearly being uh, demonstrated uh, in the in the correspondence, we just have to find a way not to restrict the innovation, but to channel it and to focus it and to make sure it's resourced appropriately. Go ahead, Councilor Patterson. Thank you. And just one last uh, item: attachment ten on here is Oak Bay Heritage Foundation Foundation Policy Manual. Uh, the Heritage Foundation uh, did just hold their AGM, and they just. Um, approved a new policy manual, but the minutes aren't out and the policy manual is not all out. So that will be forthcoming, but we'll make sure that it is there for the next discussion meeting. No, that's great. Thank you for letting us know that, Councillor Patterson. Um, I got my list here. I don't have anybody else on my list. Does anybody else wish to speak to the items here? Councillor Zelka? Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, echo the comments of uh, my council colleagues. I was listening in, and um, all, any of my concerns have been ad addressed. Uh, I also, um, with respect to Councillor Patterson's uh, concerns and uh, suggestions around the heritage, uh, I, I do look forward to the, the next session coming forward, and uh, I'll, um, I'll see if I can bring some, some, some ideas around innovation to that, to that session. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Ms. Rella's point, my observation is I think that's exactly what we need to do is to sort of, you know, create a structure by which there's an op opportunity for that body to, to, to bring forward priorities in a given year and, and, and allow us the chance to, to, to resource them appropriately. Because uh, I think that there has been a lot of frustration that ideas come forward, they get received at council and they just kind of fizzle at that point. So, uh, and in fact, we may end up having to cycle back once again to the advisory planning um, commission as well uh, under the same same premise that they may want to provide that some some more formalized structure for them to, to consider their pieces uh, in terms of references so um, I don't see any other hands up uh, Councillor Appleton is there anything else you want to add before we get to making motions I do not think I can substantively add to that no thank you okay is, and has been any calls in from the public on this one two five oh no nothing okay uh, no calls in <laughs> no uh, uh, we seem to be exhausted this, so perhaps we can get uh, a motion, our motions made here. And I would just, if we're going to go with the written pieces, I think the, there's the first one, that and that and further that, that sort of go together, um, that we might just uh, take as a thing and then we can deal with the facilitated planning session um, before we go ahead, Councillor Green. You would like a motion? I would. Thank you. I, I move the recommendations, one, that the committee refer the draft establishing bylaws for the Advisory Planning Commission Design Panel and Advisory, uh, sorry, for the Advisory Planning Commission Design Panel and Advisory Planning Commission land use to Council for consideration of first three readings and the draft terms of reference to the Public Arts Advisory Committee to Council for consideration of adoption and that staff be directed to proceed to recruitment for those three advisory bodies immediately following adoption of the establishing bylaws in December 2020, and that the current member terms for the Advisory Design Panel, Advisory Planning Commission, and the Public Arts Advisory Committee be extended to January 31st, 2021. Moved and seconded, thank you. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? I'm not seeing any, so I will call the question. Then, all those in favor? Councillor Appleton? In favor. 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Green, you're on a roll. Okay, thanks. Um, number two, that staff be requested to organize a facilitated planning session before the end of December 2020 to allow Council an opportunity for further consideration and discussion regarding the future mandate of the Heritage Commission and that current member terms for the Heritage Commission be extended to February 28th, 2021. Second. Move and second. Is there any discussion on that item? Not seeing any. I do please give feedback, anything else that you think of to uh, staff so we can guide that discussion. Uh, I will call the question. All those in favor? Councillor Appleton? In favor. Thank you. Any opposed? It's none opposed, thank you. And the last uh, piece there. Number three, that section 19, subsection A of the committee and commission policy be amended to reflect that the council liaison to the Heritage Commission is appointed as a non-voting member. Is there a seconder? Moved and seconded, thank you. Any further discussion on that item? Not seeing any then, all those in favor? Councillor Appleton? In favor. Thank you, that passes, and... Move adjournment. That was so fast. Second. <laughs> a motion to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. Thank you very much. I'm just assuming you approve there, Councillor Appleton. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you everyone uh, for that thoughtful discussion, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all next week at council meeting. Thank you.